Good evening. I would like to welcome everyone to the first meeting of 2019, the January 8th Board of County Commissioner meetings. It is 5 p.m. and I'd like to call this meeting to order. I would just ask that we take a moment of silence. Commissioner Pritchett? Yes, if y'all stand for the pledge. Moving on to item D, can I get a motion for minutes approval? Before we have that motion, sure. There were there were two proposed modifications I have. I think they were just uh, Scrivener's errors. On item J1 for the minutes, uh, toward the second half of it, where it says Commissioner Lober asked if there's any reason Mr. Baylock knows of that Allegro would not be aware of the note, uh, I'd ask that we strike note and put in the word liens, L-I-E-N-S. And then one other. Uh, on F11, on the first sentence in F11, uh, where it says after the comma, he had he had two individuals who were directors to resign. It's just missing the word ask, so he had asked two individuals who were directors to resign. But I'd, I'd move to approve them with those two modifications. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Lober, a second by Commissioner uh, Pritchett. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Commissioner Pritchett? Um, we have a resolution for a Eagle Scout. If um, Mr. Bollinger would come forward, please. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Whereas Timothy Bollinger, Joshua Timothy Bollinger, has achieved the rank of Eagle Scout, the highest rank awarded to a Boy Scout, by completing the demanding requirements of personal development, leadership, and community service, and whereas Joshua earned ordeal and brotherhood in the Order of the Arrow and has worked hard towards his Eagle Scout Award, which he's achieved on October 3rd, 2018 at the age of 18, and whereas Joshua has earned seven Eagle Palms by earning 57 merit badges, 21 of which are required for the Eagle's rank, and whereas only 5% of all Boy Scouts earn the Eagle Scout Award, a performance based on achievement with standards that have been well maintained over the years. And, well as, and whereas his Eagle project, Joshua designed and supervised the building and installation of two benches and two picnic tables for teachers and students to use while using the playground and eating lunch outside the cafeteria at Enterprise Elementary School. Whereas Joshua attends Space Coast Junior Senior High School and is involved in the st STEAM Academy. I, could, I can't say this word right. Thank you, that word program. And whereas the lessons learned by obtaining the Eagle Scout Award are important to not only the life of the Scout, but also to enhance the future development of leadership in our nation. Now therefore be it resolved that the Brevard County Board of County Commissioners does hereby recognize and congratulate Joshua Timmy, Timothy Bollinger for his outstanding efforts in obtaining his Eagle Scout Award and offers congratulations and best wishes for a successful future. I make a motion to adopt this resolution. Second. Motion by Commissioner Pritchett, second by Commissioner Lober. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Would you like to say a few things? Um, so pretty much I've been in scouting since Tiger Cub. Um, my mom's been helping me out through all of it. Uh, thank her for that. Uh, yeah, it's all I got. Thank, thank you. you. That's quite a bit. Josh.
Moving on to item F, did commissioners have anything they wanted to pull from the consent? I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve consent by Commissioner Pritchett. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Public comments, Mr. Tovey. Charles Tovey, 2555 Roberts Road, Melbourne. Uh, wrote on my card the lagoon. And just for a moment, Commissioner Smith, if you could. This um, pictures of my work that I've done in. I've waited to try and give everybody else a chance to resolve the lagoon issue and what I do and what I know I think would have the biggest impact and the quickest and best thing for the lagoon. Um, on the schematics I gave you a couple of weeks ago, I forgot to put the legend on there, but that was for the map. There was a legend on there and it was called Lagoon Man, lagoonman.com. I've done the work. I know what works and I've seen the results. I gave you a schematic of my route and that's only partial of what I do. There's before and after photos of my work. Um, I'll be revealing everything and I'm composing all the information now. Halfway through with registering all my <clears throat> business licenses and stuff. Um, and as far as the schematics, I had a choice of the pen, markers, or crayons, so I chose the, what I thought was best. And my work is salt water, fresh water, brackish water. I do all kinds of environments, air, land, and sea. I'll be straightening out my website soon. It's lagoonman.com, and I'll have all the information. And what I'm giving you now is other people have it throughout the state and our politicians in Florida and they'll be getting a copy of what I can't disclose the name of it but my suggestions for the lagoon and it's pretty evident the way I see it and I can it's obvious on the map that I have but I couldn't get good copies of it for you be working diligently to provide all that information as soon as possible um, Oh, while I was saving the lagoon, the aggressor, one of my aggressors, was excavating my property and destroying everything I have and had, and there's pretty much nothing left to destroy anymore. And they let him, and there's nothing I can do about it. And I'd like the opportunity to show and explain everything, my whole dilemma of my property issues. That's about it for now besides um, happy New Year's and I hope everybody had happy holidays. Thanks again. Thank you Mr. Toby. Okay moving on to public hearings. Item H1. Good evening commissioners. Item H1 is a request for the board to consider the first amendment to the traffic and currency and traffic uh, impact fee credit developers agreement between Brevard County, Benchmark Melbourne, 35 Associates Limited Partnership in the city of West Melbourne. In this agreement will allow the developer, I should say this amendment allows the developer to increase the number of hotel rooms and decrease the amount of square footage, commercial square footage. It also maintains the right of way that they were gonna donate the amount of impact trip fee credits that they were going to obtain and the uh, trips that they were ultimately vested for. So there's no change in those three items. If you have any questions, we're happy to answer them for you. Commission? Any discussion or motion? Move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Lober. 
Second. Second by Commissioner Pritchett. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item H2. Sure. Sure. This is the uh, the TDC term limit. It's it's come back again uh, after we've gone through the process that we've had to go through. Uh, I don't have any any real comments beyond what's already been discussed at the prior meeting, in which this uh, certainly had been hashed out in detail. Uh, so, in the interest of time, I would move to have it approved as written. Do you have any comments from the public? No. I have no cards for that item. I'll second if there's no discussion. Uh, motion by Commissioner Lober, second by Commissioner Tobia. Commissioner I just, Pritchett? I just want to make a statement on this that um, I, I'm struggling with this one because of the my appointees that I had on there were just really, really great people. So I'm not going to be voting in favor of this, and I just wanted to say why. Nothing further? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes, ma'am. Opposed. Motion passes 4 1 with Commissioner Pritchett in the negative. Item H3. Item H3 is a, uh, a petition to vacate a public utility easement. The uh, owners of, the, of lot 71 and 72 would like to vacate the uh, easement that would be a common lot line because they own parts of, of both lots and they want to get rid of that and want to vacate that. Uh, this is in the uh, sec, uh, second section in the Atlantic Heights and we've uh, done our advertisements and we have no negative input. So we, we recommend it. And staff has no concerns, correct? No. Okay. Okay. Commissioner Lover? Just briefly, since this is a D5 item, I just wanted to see what the D5 thoughts were with respect to it. Yeah, I, I, I take no issue with it. I've gone okay. through it. Motion to approve. Motion by Commissioner Pritchett. Second. Second by Commissioner Lober. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. H4. Item H4 is a two part. Uh, it's a petition to vacate a 60 foot drainage easement. The petitioner is uh, Praxair. Uh, with the vacation of this, this easement, there'll be a granting of, a, of a, a second easement that would cover the actual location of the ditch. Uh, again, we've done our, our uh, due diligence and we have no issues with this. I just put it on. Commissioner Pritchett? Yeah, this is a great project and everything's coming together so wonderfully. So when we're ready, um, Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve this. I have a motion by Commissioner Pritchett. I'll second it. Second by Commissioner Lober. Did you want to discuss? She's already addressed my concern. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Unfinished and old business. Item I-1. Good evening, Commissioners. This is the award of contracts for stormwater and Indian River Lagoon outreach and marketing services. The board previously approved advertising for these services consistent with the adopted budgets for the stormwater utility and the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Trust Fund, developing a uniform approach, look and feel to the messaging funded by each separate budget. The synergy of these two sources of funding should benefit both outreach programs. Brevard has a population of over half a million people who make numerous decisions in their daily lives that can either help or hurt water quality and the health of the Indian River Lagoon. Since 2011, staff has worked with nine partnering municipalities and the Save Our Indian River Lagoon uh, Citizen Oversight Committee more recently to identify the types of individual decisions and actions um, that impact water quality the most or have the greatest potential to help. Of the three service contracts in your packet today, services A and B provide the outreach that is mandated by the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination Permits for the county and the partnering cities. Continuing to use budgeted city and county stormwater utility funds and allocates a fraction of funding for engaging marketing expertise to improve our stormwater education outreach and public engagement campaigns. 
Based on current NPDES permit requirements, this annual work includes 128 presentations to school groups, 17 presentations to adult groups, staffing booths to provide information at 37 special weekend events, speaking at six public events, and supervising student volunteers to mark 750 storm drains a year. It also includes limited television, SCG TV, radio, newspaper, billboard, movie theater, and Google ads, movies in the park, as well as website presence and printed materials, especially utility inserts. Switching gears, service C in your packet will use less than 0.2% uh, of the Save Our Indian River Lagoon Trust Funds to contract for marketing expertise to develop and launch five campaigns. One that was included in the original Save Our Indian River Lagoon project plan back from 2016, and four that were added in the 2018 update of the plan as adopted by the County Commission. The five campaigns focus on selecting which fertilizers are best to use, how to manage grass clippings, how to properly maintain stormwater ponds and septic systems, and irrigating just enough but not too much. The Save Our Indian River Lagoon Service C scope of work uh, will aim to maximize effectiveness by including the following steps. Researching how each activity can help or hurt the lagoon. What people are doing now and why. Developing a campaign strategy to plan for each. Creating pre-testing and launching the campaigns. Using the purchasing power of the marketing firm to buy space and time and schedule for maximum gain. Measuring and reporting both the number of impressions and the public response to them and then using those measured responses, mostly surveys, to refine the messages and adjust the campaigns annually. We hear from people all the time how important the lagoon is to them, and many ask what they can do to help. These contracts will provide professionally developed marketing prompts at the best time and in the best location to help each of us make mindful choices of cleaner ways to live, work, and play that will help the lagoon recover as soon as possible and then stay healthy. I've got a couple of cards on this. I have Dr. John Windsor. Hi, hi John Windsor, uh, Melbourne, Florida. I just broke my glasses. Uh -oh. oh, I'm sorry. I do have, generally I speak to sort of and ramble. And I, I'm rambling more these days than I used to, so I thought I should help myself out with some notes, so bear with me. Um, I've worked on the lagoon for more than three decades. Uh, I've been working toward protecting the lagoon, restoring the lagoon. Um, I'm on the Citizens Oversight Committee for the Save Our Indian River Lagoon uh, project plan. Um, I was uh, appointed by the committee to serve as uh, the representative on the selection committee for this particular contract award. So I'm intimately involved with the whole process. Uh, it, it's, uh, uh, my comments tonight are I'm not representing the, the Citizens Oversight Committee. They're my comments. But I've been in all the Citizens Oversight Committee meetings and I know what's going on there. Uh, education programs have been strongly recommended by the Citizens Oversight Committee. We did all these things to the lagoon. And we continue to do these things to the lagoon uh, in spite of the fact we've had some education programs in the past that have been pretty effective at, at informing the public. We have new people coming in all the time. Uh, it's really important to make sure that those people understand how they can help and be part of this process of cleaning up the lagoon. I want to uh, turn your attention to a report that came to this board in 2016 from a group called the Precipio Group, which is a group of consultants in Palm Bay that are financial analysts. And uh, they came to the board with a survey of a project that was done in South Brevard um, uh, by, uh, by FDEP and, and uh, uh, Brevard County. And that project required an education project. The education project required some oversight, like are you just printing brochures or are you actually doing something? And so as part of this, this education program, uh, the, the, there was a survey created before the education program and two years after the education program to see how respondents, um, participants in the program, how that education program helped. 
The program some of you may be familiar with is called Blue Life. It's very popular around Bavard County. There are still advertisements running uh, in a number of locations. Um, even on Space Coast Government TV that I'm terribly addicted to. I, I grew in, I, I watch all of your meetings. I know everything you've said, and I have a tendency to remember things people <laughs> said. And some of you are pretty skeptical about the role of education in environmental restoration. Let me tell you, it works. And based on this study, and I can give you a copy of it, but it was, it, it's in your, it, I got it from your archives. Um, no, I can't see with that. Uh, the respondents obviously were more informed after the education campaign than before the education. But there were significant improvements in behavioral traits associated with lawn maintenance, lawn clippings, fertilizer applications, pesticide applications, frequency of fertilizer applications and fertilizer types since the 2012. There's a, some other um, uh, uh, conclusions from this study that are really important, but education programs work, but they have to be ongoing and go on forever. They, they just don't happen one time. Think about cigarettes and what we've done with cigarette smoking. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lisa Soto. Can you state your name and address, please? My name is Lisa Soto. I'm the Executive Director of the Marine Resources Council, and I'm here representing MRC tonight. Um, thank you for your leadership in helping us all save our Indian River Lagoon. I'm happy to be here. Happy New Year to you all. It's good to see you. Um, we know it's not going to be easy to save our lagoon, but we're proceeding with it anyway. We've got a plan in place. It's been well researched. It's been documented. We went and we found examples of where it's been done successfully. We found the science to demonstrate how the pollution is going to be reduced as a result of implementing the plan, and we're proceeding. So, you know, whenever you make a decision, you have to kind of do the best you can to come up with the information, and then you've got to launch yourself down that path. So that's what we need to do. We're there, we're at that precipice. We're starting down the path. We need to continue, stay the course, continue down the path. An important part of that plan is engaging the public in it. They're ready. We've got a highly motivated, highly alert, ready to act residency in Brevard and really throughout our Lagoon community. Um, they're, they are asking for things to do. I know I hear it all the time. What can we do, Lisa? What can we do to help in our effort, in our community's effort to save the lagoon. I'm sure you hear it also. So they're poised. Some things are harder for people to do than others. So one of the research tools that we have and something that actually I have a great deal of experience in is a tool called social marketing research. And just to, um, just to stick to my notes here a little bit. Just to be clear, social marketing is not social media. It's not about using Facebook and websites and Twitter accounts to change uh, awareness or behavior. It's about using research tools like targeting uh, and, uh, and segmenting audiences and figuring out why people are doing what they're doing, what is it going to take to get them to change, what's the likelihood they're going to change, and then what are the expected results. There are lots and lots of examples. Uh, Dr. Windsor provides one about the Blue Life program here in Brevard. It's been successful in the past. I've got hundreds of examples in the literature. It is what we've successfully used to reduce tobacco use, an addictive substance, 40 percent. Social marketing campaign called the Truth Campaign. The Click It or Ticket Campaign. I mean, who wore seatbelts you know, when we were younger? Now everybody. Who doesn't wear a seatbelt now? You know, a 500 percent increase in seatbelt use, social marketing campaign. And then an example right here from Florida, my colleague Dr. Claudia Listopad and I just um, published a paper in an international peer review scientific journal called Landscape and Urban Planning, just hot off the presses, uh, evaluating the effectiveness of Pinellas County's ordinance. Not only did we show that Pinellas County residents were significantly more knowledgeable about their fertilizer ordinance than the two adjacent counties, uh, but that also it resulted in a significant decrease in their pollutant load. So we were able to link accurately and scientifically a public education campaign with a pollution reduction. And we can do that here. So we're ready. You know, we're one of the uh, contractors that, that if, you know, with your kindness and graciousness you will approve today. We've got the capabilities to do it. Uh, we uh, have an outstanding team uh, here at Brevard County that we have to work with. We have examples from our industry and from, uh, from our state. Uh, and I am here to encourage you to vote affirmatively uh, for this contract to go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Finham. I hope I said that last name correctly. Finham? Finham. Okay. 
You'll say it up here. Name and address, please. Uh, my name is Chris Pine, and I'm from MTN Advertising, Satellite Beach, Florida. Um, <clears throat> I'm a Chris Pine Creative Director, partner at uh, MTN. We were the ones that were awarded the uh, services B and C of the outreach campaign. Uh, wanted to give you a little bit of background on ourselves and um, kind of our philosophy on, on how to approach this. Um, when we received the RFP, we were very excited to bid on this. We thought that uh, our experience and our talents and our passion made us a very uh, great match for this outreach, and also that the, uh, the outreach itself was very necessary to the health uh, and the sustainability of the lagoon going forward. Um, we've been in business for 32 years. We are considered a full service agency. We have 10 staff members that are part creatives and part marketers. Our uh, staff includes uh, <clears throat> excuse me, marketing strategy and analysis, uh, campaign development and management, media buying, digital marketing, uh, placement, graphic design, web development, basically the full stop. Um, and so we believe that we can be of assistance to this program. Um, although we're a local agency, we do have some rather large clients. We work with the uh, Florida's natural gas industry, promoting energy conservation as well as uh, environmental and safety concerns. Uh, we work with the UNES uh, U.S. National Laboratory aboard the International Space Station, promoting utilization of the space station and also its STEM programs uh, and trying to foster the next generation of uh, scientists and engineers. Um, <clears throat> so no matter what the subject is, the reality is, is that what we do is communicate and we're good at it. Um, we help our customers every day to try to create engaging and effective messages that encourage action, and we believe that we can do that for this initiative as well. Today's individuals have more control over how they consume information than ever before, and because of that, marketing is no longer a method, it's no longer a, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> a means of uh, volume and frequency. Today's marketing has to be strategic, and it has to be meaningful in order to get an effect. And we feel that those are things that we're good at. Um, we believe that a noticeable impact on the lagoon is going to be a function of educating the public on what is happening, what can happen, and what should happen, and empowering those people to make the choices that are going to be better for the community as a whole going forward. We want to put the power in the people's hands to make the right decisions. Um, as far as our approach, our approach me, uh, is based more on fundamental marketing. Uh, it's based on fundamental marketing methods, which is less madmen and more science. It is about identifying a problem, research, uh, hypothesizing, uh, testing, execute, analyzing, reporting, and refining. And that said, we start with our research, which is conducted through uh, surveys, focus groups. That allows us to understand what we're trying to accomplish and how to best make an impact and where those audiences are that are going to be most responsible or most responsive to what we do uh, and then make those choices accordingly. We use that research to formulate our strategy um, and that is where we develop our objectives and our tactics. Again, our, we are focused on making the most impact for the dollar spent. Um, we want to be considered good stewards of the county's money and the taxpayers' monies and make sure that we are actually getting a, an effect on what we're doing. Um, finally, measuring success, uh, that's a function of what we establish in those objectives, those key performance indicators, and also there's so much data that we can collect now that goes beyond just the idea of impressions on a billboard or a newspaper ad. We can do a lot more. There's a lot more to track. There's a lot more conversions we can see. And we can actually justify what we're spending and make adjustments to go forward and make a, uh, effective uh, steps for, next, uh, for our impact. OK, um, your, yeah. your time's up. Sorry. I have a quick question. Yes. Have you done the kind of campaign that deals with like large bodies of water and pollutants and environmental as stuff? As far before? as actual large bodies of water, this is relatively new to us. But to be honest, we've done outreach campaigns uh, specifically to uh, communities to uh, understand their, their knowledge, also to, uh, to tell them about, uh, so for example, with our natural gas customers, one of the things that we have to do is part of their mandate is to uh, educate the population on safety protocols, understanding what to do, uh, things like that. We also have to take surveys about what they understood before, the messaging that went out, and how much they understood afterwards. And so we feel that basically any of the marketing that we can do can be translated to this initiative. Okay. Thank you.
Gail Meredith. Name and address, please. Gail Meredith, Satellite Beach. I'm on the board of the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition, and uh, thank you, commissioners, for your interest in the lagoon, your support of the lagoon. I wanted to speak in favor of the contract. Um, I've been involved since the beginning, since, and involved in the uh, campaign for the sales tax, and before that, my family's been here since 1970, and we live on the water. And um, when I came back to live here, after living in the Northwest, I experienced the condition of the lagoon six years ago. I've been to every single meeting I could go to since then. I've been to every single Citizens Oversight Committee meeting, except for two. And um, I really want to encourage you to vote for this contract. Uh, we have made a certain progress until now, and I think future progress depends on our ability to connect in a deep way with the citizens and to engage them in changing their behaviors. Because the, the lagoon has been cleaned up before. I mean, the muck has been dredged. And uh, it just happened again. And a lot of our citizens are cynical because they see that happening. And the next step is to really educate and engage them. And so far, we've been speaking to the choir. We're not uh, extending our reach into the, into the population with the techniques we've used so far. And I want to encourage the commissioners to vote for educating the people and being involved with them more. I think that's the next step. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. MJ Waters. Name and address, please. Hi, my name's MJ Waters. I live at 3040 LeConte Street in Melbourne. And I am currently president of the board of the Brevard Indian River Lagoon Coalition. Um, and like the last speaker, I have been to 90% of the COC meetings over the past almost two years that they've been meeting and almost everyone who has ever come in a professional capacity to one of the COC meetings whether it was an individual a scientist someone involved in one of the projects that was being presented has asked for education and behavior change support for this because we all know if we don't stop the inflow of negative pollution, fertilizer, stormwater runoff into the lagoon. It doesn't matter how much we improve our wastewater or how much muck we dredge. That is an essential part of it. And what that's going to take is not just pamphlets, but behavior change. And I spent 30 years in corporate communications for a Fortune 100 company. And we found that that is the only thing that really works for long-term change. And if you look at things like seat belts, smoking, and the changes that have been made in this country over years because of that, it's because of behavior change efforts that have been involved. So it's not, quote, marketing and advertising as much as it is effective strategic communications. And we need to put resources with people who do this for a living to do this because this is not something that any of us can just sit down and whip up um, over a cup of coffee. It's really important to do that. Um, and I think this is a key part of the overall project. I also volunteer at the Brevard Zoo one day a week in conservation. And I would venture to say 80% of the residents who come and talk to me there because we have an exhibit about the lagoon say, what can I do? Now, these are people who live here. You know, they read the paper, they probably voted for the sales tax, but they're still uncertain what kind of actions they can take, their community can take, their Boy Scout troop, Girl Scout troop can take. So there is a hungry audience for this, but there's also a group out there that just really doesn't understand that their personal uh, act actions can have a negative impact on the lagoon. So I ho encourage you to support this because I think it's really critical to the overall success of the project. Thank, Thank you. you. That's all the cards I have. Commission? Commissioner Smith? Yeah, I, I would like to just pitch in because <clears throat> I spent an awful lot of time supporting the lagoon over the last four years I've been here and served as chairman of the Indian River Lagoon Council and attended all their meetings up until the last um, uh, month. And 
as much as we can do physically for this lagoon, I think education is a, a big key, a big key factor in the success of our ongoing um, success. And without education, you've got just a few people pushing, and you've got an awful lot of people just hanging out. So if we can get everybody pushing in the same direction, then I think we have a long-lasting success. And to quote our illustrious uh, Congressman Bill Posey, we have to just, and it's very simplified, we just have to stop putting bad stuff in and get the bad stuff out and educate the people so that they don't put any more bad stuff in. Commissioner Tobia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a couple questions uh, for staff with your indulgence. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Parker, the, the agenda report states that these funds go beyond prior stormwater programs. Um, it's my understanding $420,000 of, $420, of soil funds over two, over two years will be used on these programs. How much uh, of the soil funds are required uh, by state or federal law to be spent on education and marketing? None of the swirl funds are required by our permits. It's the stormwater utility funds that are required. Thank you. Um, under these agreements, the county could be billed up to $155 per hour for research. Can you tell me a little bit about what we will be receiving for that $155 and how many hours you expect to be, uh, we're sorry, we expect to be billed at that rate? Um, so I think uh, Lisa and Chris both gave some information on the kinds of, kinds of research that go into creating these sorts of campaigns. I don't have a breakdown of specifically how many hours would be billed at those rates. I do have a suggested breakdown of um, how much there, there's about, um, as an example, for the stormwater pond maintenance campaign um, for which there's a $50,000 initial budget in this fiscal year. Um, 60 to 100 hours would be spent on that research and discovery phase uh, for a total of 10 to 16 thousand dollars. So, uh, a follow up, madam. Absolutely. Uh, so, is is that research? I'm sorry. Is that on uh, an advertising research, or is that on uh, environmental research? I guess is the better no, question. No, not not environmental research. It's on um, on public. You know, what is the public doing now? Why are they doing what they're doing now? What, why aren't they doing the kinds of things that would be more protective of water quality? And what messages um, conveyed in what ways might convince people, motivate people, empower people to make decisions that would be more helpful to the lagoon? Um, what basis do we have, what empirical basis do we have to believe that 610000 in total funding would not be better spent directly on the lagoon rather than on uh, advertising? Uh, I, I've spoken with Dr. Peter Burrill, um, who holds a PhD in environmental science, and he believed the funds would be far better spent on infrastructure uh, to prevent continued pollution on the lagoon. In the 2018 adopted plan. Um, there's an analysis of each education and outreach campaign and um, some assumptions made about, you know, what percent of the people, you know, 10% of the people that you might reach and uh, of that 10%, you know, how many might change the way they're doing things and what would the load reduction from that change be. And so, you know, based on that and the funding allocated in the plan, we've estimated that these specific uh, outreach campaigns would result in an average cost of $49 per pound of nitrogen removed. 
When you compare that to all the other project types in the plan, um, upgrades of wastewater treatment plants cost uh, almost 10 times that, $344 a pound. Um, sewer lateral repair and rehabilitation, $639 per pound. Um, septic system removal by sewer expansion, $1,050 per pound. Septic system uh, upgrades, $860 per pound. Stormwater projects are, are a good uh, buy at $117 a pound. Muck removal, uh, $671 per pound. Oyster bars, $400 per pound. Uh, planted shorelines, $345 per pound. So of all the pro project options in the plan, outreach is the most cost effective based on the analysis that was done in that 2018 plan. Thank you. And I'm not advocating against education. I, I think it gets to the, the, the follow-up here. If we did not contract out for these services, would you utilize county resources to meet permitting requirements, such as our social, social media specialist and our public information officer? Um, we, we have been contracting out these services since well, we've been contracting out these services to the Blue Life Program since 2011. Before that, we contracted them out through a partnership with the Water Management District called the uh, Blue Wave Program, the, the Wave Program. So we've contracted these out for a very long time. Um, you know, outreach would, I, I think it's an, we were mandated to do outreach, so we would have to shuffle people in order to meet these mandates, but we do not have staff on board to provide the level of service mandated in our permits. Fine, and, and, and this is just a follow-up. Um, we've done this mm -hmm. since 2011. Um, during that time, have you, would you say the condition of the lagoon has improved, or would you say <laughs> the condition of the lagoon has gotten worse? Um, obviously, the condition of the lagoon has gotten much worse. The, the Precipio study that um, Dr. John Windsor mentioned, that compared, um, we did survey-based approach to try to understand what people were doing in terms of fertilizer use uh, before and after our campaign. We also looked at dog waste and a few other things. At the same time, we looked at um, data collected by the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Sciences on fertilizer sold in the county of Brevard. And so during the period of time that we launched that campaign, fertilizer sales reduced dramatically in Brevard County. Um, and the, based on, if you assume that people who bought that fertilizer applied that fertilizer and uh, based on IFAS studies, about 30% of fertilizer that's used soaks down th past beyond the roots of the grass and the roses and whatever into the groundwater and, and a fraction of that makes it to the lagoon. So if you take that small fraction that makes it to the lagoon, multiply it by the tons of uh, fertilizer sold in Brevard and look at the change between before our campaign and after our campaign, that a $150,000 campaign stopped 45, over 45,000 pounds of nitrogen from reaching the lagoon, which uh, is a very large number compared to what we're trying to do with the rest of the plan. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Commissioner Pritchett. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Miss Virginia, thank you for that. I was going to ask you about that because I was able to ask you at a staff meeting yesterday if you've seen any cost benefit, and and that's one of the items you gave me. And thank you for the information on cost per pound. That's that's very eye-opening. You had said yesterday that it was significantly less, but the uh, data you brought today it's significantly less. Um, I'm I'm going to vote to to put this through tonight, but I, I would ask and I, I know you're going to be doing this, that we would keep an eye on it, making sure that we're, we're still obtaining a benefit as we move into to the future advertisement and education that we're doing. Um, I, I, I don't can't just be from being on the commission or serving in government, but since we've started this, there's a lot of things that I've learned, too, from the outreaches we're doing. I, I think um, I would enjoy finding out what types of things we're doing and how we're doing it so that... Um, 
maybe we could just think through the benefit that, that we're doing for the community on, on our outreaches and, and education programs. Um, I'd be interested in seeing it getting started heavily in the school so the children can be taught this is a lifestyle, just like some of the click it and ticket, click it or ticket things and give a hoot, don't pollute. I remember that from years ago too. But these are things that, that I would love to see starting to, to grow. We, we've got to change our lifestyle. So I, um, I'm, I'm going to vote this through tonight. Thank you for all the work, and I would just ask that you would um, keep your eye on it and make sure that we're always doing the best we can with these funds. I would just say, you know, I, I took issue immediately with, with the amount, you know, and, and I appreciate the analysis based on the hypotheticals because really in reality, because fertilizer sales are down at a specific point in time could have more to do with the economy based on the fact that if the economy is not very good or jobs aren't well, people aren't paying for landscaping service, which doesn't in turn allow them to buy fertilizer. Um, I don't have a problem with, with education. I think that's key. But as we know, when we're basing it based on surveys of people and behaviors, oftentimes people may not always be truthful or they may not always be forthcoming based on their behaviors. Of course, they're going to say that they've improved their fertilizing habits, they're, you know, they've cleared their drains, they've done all these right things because as we know and just with our last election, oftentimes people aren't honest when they're polled or surveyed. So I, I take less weight with that than I do on the condition of the lagoon and, and I think we need to concentrate as much money as possible on infrastructure and I know I've, I've said that for two years now and I sound like a broken record and, and I'll keep saying that and I think that this, this amount here is excessive in my opinion. I don't think half a million dollars on education, if we haven't figured out how to educate the public and, and, and how to, I think without talking in circles here, I think we need to look at people's behaviors as far as how we can impact their behaviors rather than say, well, we hope that this campaign's going to work. We hope that this education outreach is going to work. We hope that this is going to have this impact. And oh, by the way, we're, we're hoping that they change their behaviors. I think everyone in the county obviously knows how bad the lagoon is. Mm. But most people in the county don't call me and say, please come to my kid's school or please, please come and do a, do a meeting or a presentation. They say, stop dumping raw sewage in the lagoon. That's what they call, that's what they say when they call my office. Not please, please give us more information so we can change our bad ways. People know the, the, the things that they either have done or have not done that have helped or, or hurt the lagoon and they know the things that they, that are out of their hands. So I think that, I think half a million dollars is almost a slap in the face to, to everybody that, that has been paying this tax and it wants us to improve our infrastructure. And, and I think we can dredge and we can educate and we can put nice oyster beds in and we can do all the things that are correct, but if we don't fix what's causing the problem first, then all of it's going to be for naught and we're going to be here in 25, 30 years assuming we can get to a place where we're on the upswing of cleaning it up. So I won't be supporting it because I think it's too much money. Commissioner Lober? Just a, a question for you, Madam Chair. In, in terms of your inclination at present, um, what do you think an appropriate amount of money might be for advertising that you'd be comfortable supporting? Oh, I, I don't, I never really thought it through because I figured that this was an all or nothing based on the fact that it's three separate contracts, you know, two pots of money and it's all one, one agenda item. You know, again, I think it's more important, and I think one of the marketing guys hit on it, is researching what works more importantly than, than just saying we're going to throw everything at it in hopes that we get a good response out of these seven things that we're doing. I think that, you know, I hate, I am one of the biggest proponents of spending money on, on more research, especially when it comes to Lagoon, but I think if you're going to, if you're going to spend money on, you might, you might not want to make sure that you're spending it correctly and it's more targeted because we may find that we're wasting tens of thousands of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars on efforts that are sort of futile if, if we can be more focused in, in areas that people respond to. And if, if I may just... I don't know what that number is. I wish I could give it to you, but I, I don't like this plan the way it, it sits because, again, it's, it's, it's not detailed enough. It's, it's too much money and I think that it, it's not focused and it needs to be focused. I'll tell you, this is an interesting one. I, I came in here planning on supporting it and I think I've, I've been convinced otherwise at this point. But I, I do like the idea uh, of spending something on outreach and something on education. I, I just like to give staff as much uh, of a heads up and as much info as possible 
to enable them to, to put together a proposal that might be more palatable. Uh, you know, I, I just I, I don't have an inclination either in terms of an amount. I would I would like to spend something. I do think there is potentially some value in it. Uh, but again, I, I do have concerns uh, that I share with you and, and with Commissioner Tobia with respect to the amount. Um, it, it does seem, especially when you delve into the hourly rate, as to some of these items that are 155 an hour, I believe. And I, I think I may have even seen one that was 165, but it wasn't necessarily a, a research-based item in there. Uh, I do have some concerns. So if, if by my voting no, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to convey is I don't want my vote no to be taken or construed as a permanent no or a, or a categorical no, I would like you to come back with something else uh, that's perhaps a little bit more reasonable in terms of the bottom line, or perhaps if, if um, it's something that you're interested in doing, we could have the same exact amount going toward the lagoon, but we have some infrastructure repairs built into the same proposal. I don't have a problem with that. I'd support spending this amount or more money uh, on the lagoon if it's structured a little bit differently where it favors clearly infrastructure. Uh, but I, I would just encourage staff to bring this back with a lower amount because I would like to support something. Um, and I, I am somewhat flexible in terms of the exact amount. It's, it's something where I hadn't really given that much thought um, prior to hearing the arguments here. Uh, but I, I just don't want to see this die when it gets voted down this evening. Commissioner Tobia? Thank oh, you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. Wait. Uh, for oh, I, I went out of order, I guess. I'm sorry. Sorry. Commissioner Smith, I'm sorry. Ms. Parker. Ms. Parker, um, we're mandated to educate, use some monies to educate the public. Um, is there a formula that has been issued? Where do we come up with these numbers and programs? There's, there's not a formula. The permits um, require uh, specific activities and um, you negotiate those levels of activities. So the, the budget that is in there from the stormwater utility is based on what Brevard County and the participating municipalities have negotiated in their current um, NPDES permits. Okay, and so you're talking about a total of how much right now in this, in this proposal? Um, the, the, the stormwater-based part of the proposal is about 95000 a year. The half-cent sales tax funded part of the proposal is larger in the first year than it would be in subsequent years because the first year you're doing that research to develop, you know, to figure out who your target audience is, to figure out what those messages are that are going to work with that target audience. Um, and so you've got more... Uh, work up front and then the following years you implement that message you buy uh, whatever you know billboard time or or you know, wh whatever the engagement piece is um, and so it's uh, 275,000 of half cent sales tax in the first year and then 145,000 a year after that there's also if you look at the uh, in the plan in year five there's a bump up again to refresh um, that messaging, you know, things, things change, community character changes, the condition of the lagoon will change, um, and so it, we may need more than just the small refresher, we may need a, a bigger refresher at that time. Okay, so in the first year we're talking about $265,000, correct? Two seventy-five. dollars Okay. Well, I mean total, the ninety-five plus the two seventy-five is three sixty-five. I'm sorry. Okay, so... Um, I think most people would agree that education is extremely important, but we would all agree that actively fixing the problems is also extremely important. Let's get the muck out. Let's stop the bad stormwater from going in. Let's um, stop the fertilizers from running into the uh, Indian River Lagoon and, and try and educate people so that they would stop uh, excessively fertilizing their lawn. So. If it's $365,000 in the first year to educate, and, and I reiterate the fact that we're mandated to, to, to spend some money on education, how much money are we spending overall on these other projects in the first year? Um, there's about $46 million a year coming in. Okay, so we're talking about we're, we're doing all the things that Commissioner um, 
as Nardi is talking about by spending 46 million. So this 365,000 is really just a drop in the bud, in the bucket, and it's very purposeful because it goes to a specific target, and that's to educate people so that we can help this lagoon as we improve it year by year. We can keep it improved. Is that not correct? That's that's the purpose of the education. So. I would submit that $46 million is being spent on fixing the lagoon, and the $365,000 is not excessive. It's very purposeful, and it's going to educate the public, and hopefully the $46 million that we spend will get us to a turning point, and the, and, and the education will help us stay the course so that it doesn't backslide again. Commissioner Pritchett. Thank you, Madam Chair. On these items that we're voting through today, we're voting on service A, B, and C. Correct. A and B are mandated, and so, you know, the, we're, we have those. So what we're really looking at is service C, which is really the vote and the discussion tonight. Last year it was 275000 This year you have it 145000 So actually it's already been a negotiated drop of 130000 Here's a couple things that I think about is we had this plan in place when the voters voted it through. And it was, it was fairly sp specific. There's a little bit about it that's fluid. But I want to be real careful, not that we can't change this. You know, we can, guys. We can change C all we want here right now if, if you want to do it. But I want to be real careful we, we keep this with voter intent. My goal is that we get this thing going in the right direction and we get rid of the, t the tax. It's a lot of taxes coming out on us. And so I, I would like to get to a point to where we're, we're making enough headway that we're not having to tax our community with that half a cent sales tax. It might not sound like a lot, but obviously $42 million a year is quite a bit. Just a side note, I've talked to all of our representatives about doing septic tank inspections. We've got to start inspecting the septic tanks. They're leaking. And actually, every one of them are, are on board with this, so I'm hoping something will come out of the state of Florida this year to where we can have a mandated ex in inspection and figure out a way to do that so that it's equitable to the whole community because if they keep leaking we're all paying for them so we've got to stop the bad stuff going in and find a way to get the bad stuff out uh, another thing commissioners we're going to have to deal with this sales tax was for new projects so we have leaking infrastructure in all the municipalities and, and in the county we're going to have to look at maybe doing a rate hike and start fixing these problems. We should pay for our own waste. And so if we're not charging enough money for in rates to quit the people on the sewer systems from causing these leaks, we have the sewage leaks in, into the river, we have to raise rates and maybe make that a priority with the enterprise price funds of fixing our, our system. It's something we're just going to have to talk about and, and look at doing. And for three of us, it's not going to be real good because we have elections coming up, but we're going to have to really look at doing this. It's, it's the right thing to do. So that's what I think we need to look at is, is, is raising those user rates, fixing those problems, not sidetracking these funds into things that they weren't voted to do so we can eventually get rid of this tax. It does what we're looking for it to do. So I think right now we, we kind of need to have the conversation about service C, what you guys want to do with that. A and B are mandated. Service C is the one that's got a little bit of negotiation here. But on that note, this is the plan that was voted for by the voters that was laid out in that program. But if we want to discuss that with those funds for service C, that would probably be where we want to set up. Thank you. Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to reject all proposals and direct staff to come back to prepare a new RFP to meet minimum permitting uh, requirements if necessary. I request that the Citizens Oversight Committee do further review to determine if it is the most effective use of resources as part of their 2019 update, Madam Chair. I'll pass the gavel in second. Any discussion? My discussion is that I'm not going to support that at all. I think this is equitable, I think it's feasible, and I think it's a bargain to do this. And education is extremely important. And I don't think this is an excessive amount of money to educate the public and, and help improve this lagoon going forward. I'm hitting my button. I, don't, I can't show you my light. So. <laughs> That's fair enough. 
And I'll just say, you know, rather than tit for tat on everything, I mean, the only mandate is on stormwater education based on the permits. It's not based on the collection of the tax. And as far as raising user rates, I don't have a problem with, with evaluating where we are with user rates. But we can't now expect people to have increased excessive increased sewer rates to fix a problem when maybe commissions of past should have been raising them at a, at a reasonable level when they needed to. But we collected $22 million more than we planned. And if we can't start using that, some of that money to address those issues like I and I, to start addressing those issues of, of getting people off of, off of septic, to address issues that have to deal with infrastructure, I, I will never support anything that comes before this commission that has to do with, with, the, with the tax because I don't know how you justify pulling muck out of a river while dumping crap and garbage into it and say, well, you know, we'll just raise user rates for everybody because the ratepayers can pay. Well, the bottom line is, no, is nobody did raise it. So I, I would easily point to the county government and say, well, why didn't you maintain your infrastructure? Well, if you had an unwilling elected body that charged appropriate rates, maybe that's why they didn't fix it. I'm sure the utility worked with what they had. But the fact of the matter is, if we don't address the failing infrastructure, we're going to be right back where we are now. And we can do all the dredging and all the half a million dollars in education and try and justify it by saying it's a drop in the bucket compared to the $46 million. Well, half a million dollars is a lot of money to some people, and it's a lot of money to me. So. Well, it is, and it definitely is a lot of money, but we have to keep things in perspective. And this $365,000 is going to help educate the public so that... And it's okay that you're comfortable with the way that they're educating the public and you're comfortable with this proposal and, and you know, I give that to you. I am just not. Okay. I am not. I think it's too much money. I'm good with that. Commissioner okay. Finch, I see your lights on? Thank you, sir. I, I agree as, as, as far as fixing infrastructure, we have to. You're only talking about unincorporated areas. I live in the city of Titusville. You have the city of Cocoa Water, city of Melbourne Water. And our rates have increased significantly because we're dealing with the felling infrastructure. They have raised our rates and they have an upswing of rates for the next 15 years. They're going to heavily increase these rates to fix these. We're not doing that in the unincorporated level. So it's the unincorporated levels right now that are failing that we have jurisdiction over. We need to increase the rates and fix the felling infrastructure, just like the municipalities are doing. We need to stay on the municipalities to make sure they're doing it at an adequate amount to fix theirs also. But if we start taking the lagoon funds here, and we have people that live in, in the unincorporated areas, and they're paying these taxes, and they're paying all the unincorporated problem with the fee-based structures, it's not fair. And I personally wouldn't have voted for that tax as being a, as a person who pays those taxes in Titusville and then pay for the, all of the unincorporated. It's, it's, just not, it's just not a fair tax then. That was a question to, uh, to staff. If I turn this on first, that would help. Uh, Ms. Parker, with respect to another option here, would it benefit or would it be feasible if we were to pass services A and B at this point and then revisit C in a couple of weeks at the next meeting? Um, yes, that would be very helpful to get that moving and um, if you want to revert to what was in the 2016 plan that, that, that was published for the people to review before they voted for the half cent sales tax, that was 125000 a year specifically for uh, storm water, uh, for, sorry, fertilizer issues. So instead of addressing the five campaigns, we could drop back to a single campaign at 125 you know, do our pre and post um, comparisons, try to collect the data to see, you know, the extent to which this is working or not. My, my thought at this point, uh, I'm not going to support uh, my colleague's motion with respect to this, but if someone chooses to make a motion to approve services A and B, uh, while tabling C, or we can just leave it off at this point and address it on the 22nd, I would support that if someone wants to make that motion. So unless there's further discussion, I guess we can have a vote on. Uh, I'll make that motion. Well, let's, let's address Commissioner Tobias' motion first. Is everyone understanding what we're voting on? Oh, yes, sir. OK. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Nay. 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 OK. Uh, fails uh, four to one. And then Commissioner Smith, you had a motion? Excuse me, I'm sorry. Sir, you had a motion? I did. I would like to um, endorse the motion that you suggested that we vote on A and B. 
and we have C brought back to us at a later date. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry, is there, do you wish yeah. to have a discussion? I apologize. I was going to say yeah, a, man, yeah, a question to staff on that one. Please. Your indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You don't take over again? <laughs> I, 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 was, I was a little confused on the first motion yeah. versus because, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Ms. Barker, uh, if we were to go ahead with service A and service B, while that doesn't come out of Sorrel, um, is that mandated uh, directly uh, or is that above the minimum requirement for either the federal law or, or, or I guess, state grant minimums? A and B is what it has taken since 2011 to meet the permit requirements of the state, of the county and participating cities. Those NPDES permits are renegotiated on a five-year cycle. I'm not sure, you know, what all the city's cycles are, how that might change, but as of right now, A and B are the level of service that is required in our current permits. Thank you. Okay. You want to take over? You want me to continue? I can take over okay. now if that's all right. It was a little confusing in the beginning, Sorry. so yeah. that's okay. That's all right. Okay, I have a motion. And I second it. I second by Commissioner Lober. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Are we going to give any kind of direction or as far as item C, does Commission desire to give any direction? I, my suggestion would be if there are a couple of different options that you could provide us that are lower in amount than what was initially proposed for today's meeting, uh, I would certainly would appreciate having more than one option. Um, I don't know that there's any reason not to have one option that is the minimum, just so we can see what that would entail, and then an option that's somewhere between that option or that lowest amount and what was proposed this evening. Madam Chair, would, yes. would this require a completely new uh, RFP and if so what's the what can we get staff to tell us what's the process for that or would it be best to go with the second part of my motion which would be uh, to ask that this be brought up again in the 2019 update which is you know which is pending um, I mean I, Frank yeah I was gonna and I believe this is the case and I want to ask the county attorney to confirm it but I believe the board has the option and the discretion, if it so chose, to ask staff to go back and <clears throat> negotiate with the uh, current vendors that were under consideration to change <clears throat> the scope of the and the amount of the services provided. Because I, what I heard the board saying is they weren't comfortable with the with the amount of services being provided at that cost. Now. <clears throat> I know we we could do that in other areas when we deal with group health insurance, et cetera. In I just want to confirm can. that we, if the board so chose, they could do that here too. Yes. Commissioner Pritchett. Yeah. Um, as far as giving direction also, maybe if you can highlight, like I know you said fertilizer, we've, we've done that. Maybe what it is we're going to target with the lagoon funds and, and the amounts, like Commissioner Lober was requesting, so we can kind of get an idea of what it is. Mr. Tavaya. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would rather us take a little bit of time with this. I think if we gave staff, not that I have any uh, issues with staff direction, but I certainly would like the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee to uh, review uh, their proposals given these guidelines and bring something back to us instead of just going directly from staff. I certainly don't want to under undercut the Citizens Oversight. So I'd have a motion that at least the Citizens Oversight Committee, given uh, the direction, I guess, that we've presented up here uh, have the opportunity to uh, weigh in under this 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 new scope. Again, um, I just don't know how clear that direction is. If we're if if the direction is to reduce, to target, to I, I mean, I, from what what just what, do better. I mean, uh, not not do better because <laughs> uh, I think they've worked very diligently and I appreciate their time and their concern. But I think we've said that. $420,000 of Sorrel funds is too much. Right. So uh, maybe to, and, and, and we found out that there are minimums that we are mandated uh, to do per federal and, and state law, and uh, it sounds like we've met those according to. Um, right. None of the Sorrel funds would go towards correct. meeting the minimum. So correct. everything so, from the tr trust fund is 
So we now, discretionary. so yes, so we now can make the determination whether or not any of these is better spent on infrastructure since we've met the minimum requirements uh, of, of the, the fees. So um, less than 420, it sounds like uh, the board's direction on that. Okay, and you made a motion? Is that? Okay, so. You uh, said the words, I want to make a motion. Sure, so. I'll make a motion to uh, um, request that the citizens over site committee do further review to determine uh, a lower amount uh, of resources as part of their 2019 update. Commissioner Lober? Realistically, just a, a question for staff. Uh, how long do you think it would take to turn around without uh, interfering with the other work that you have to, to get an answer from the oversight committee, from the citizens oversight committee? Um, we will be discussing the proposed 2019 plan update at their January meeting next Friday. So I will put this in their agenda packet this week and they'll, they'll discuss it next Friday and we'll have something back to you in February. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Second by Commissioner Lober. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. All right. We have item J1. I don't know if we should move J5 up because we have a lot of people here that are going to speak on that. And, and I don't want to kick Yuri to the side, but I notice we have the sheriff here as well, and I'm sure his time's valuable. Does commission have a problem if we move that item to the front? I prefer it. Okay. Yeah. So we're here item J5 now. Commissioner Lober. Okay, I was planning on addressing this a little bit later, so bear with me. I apologize. Um, no, no, that's okay. It's not a problem. Actually, I think it works out better for the vast majority of folks that are here on this issue. Um, obviously, I, I think the, the actual content of the ordinance and the cover sheet that appended, was appended with it um, does speak for itself. I, I do want to raise a few points that aren't contained in there. Um, this particular text was developed in consultation with the sheriff and with the director of animal services, Joe Hellebrand, who is in the back as well. Uh, it's gone to the county attorney. Uh, it's had uh, quite a bit of, of revision uh, back and forth to ensure that it is as narrowly tailored as possible um, while still accomplishing the goals that we're setting forth and remaining enforceable. Um, there are a lot of different municipalities, a lot of different counties, uh, both in Florida and elsewhere, that have ordinances that address uh, this particular topic. Uh, some are more uh, overreaching, some are much more broad. Um, I will tell you that the, the purpose with respect to this is to reflect uh, what community standards have evolved to be in this area and elsewhere. Uh, and just as um, something like a brothel would be considered morally repugnant to the vast majority of individuals, um, mills, puppy mills, and kitten factories are to the vast majority of individuals morally repugnant. Uh, that's not to say that another municipality or another county uh, isn't free to have a different opinion. With respect to this, uh, the actual text of the, the resolution as it's proposed allows for the municipalities within Brevard County uh, to adopt their own ordinances if they don't agree with what we've done or some portion of it uh, to basically supersede that portion that, that is incompatible with respect to, uh, to this resolution. So if there are individuals in Melbourne or there are individuals in any of the other municipalities in Brevard that feel strongly that there is something either too lenient or too stringent with respect to this ordinance, I would encourage them to bring it to their, their respective city councils or city commissions um, to determine what the, the community sentiment is there. Um, I will tell you that um, my biggest concern in this area is where animals are sourced from. Uh, I don't believe that the vast majority or potentially any of the pet stores in this area are currently abusing animals once they reach Brevard County. Uh, my concern relates back to where those animals are sourced from and just as if I were to buy something online, I can't control how that item may have been created or treated, it's impossible for anyone to have any form of, of real oversight as to how the animals are treated when they're being bred with the commercial purpose of being sold in mind. Um, I can tell you that one of the items that was suggested, and I've had a number of people call and discuss this with me, uh, instead of having a, uh, a definition of hobby breeder capped at 20 kittens or puppies, I was asked, well, what about potentially having uh, two litters? 
And the problem with that, again, it harkens back to enforceability. We have no way shy of genetically testing a slew of animals to figure out, well, this dog corresponds with, with this one and this dog corresponds with that one. Uh, so a lot of the actual text in there that may seem somewhat um, arbitrary or may seem a little bit odd and that we'd specify an exact number was necessary to ensure that we would be able to enforce this. And it's not something that we would simply see on paper, feel good about and say, oh, only to find that we're wasting BCSO's resources um, in seeing them attempt to enforce it and then having it overturned because there's some ambiguity or there is some additional burden that's unnecessarily placed upon them uh, to, to achieve the aim. Um, with respect to the folks that support this, and I, I don't know who all we have here this evening apart from the sheriff who I see in the back, uh, I know that a number of animal rescue groups have reached out in favor. Uh, I'm going to pass. I've got copies for everyone up here. Just something that's representative um, that I've seen uh, come through in the email, I believe today, even though it's dated earlier, uh, from one of, the, uh, one of the animal rescue groups that wrote in favor of this particular motion. Uh, it, it, of course, is, is up to us to determine the limits, um, assuming we're inclined as a commission to pass this, to determine the appropriate limits. If the commission doesn't believe 20 is an appropriate number, I think we have an excellent opportunity with Sheriff Ivey and with um, Mr. Hellebrand here as well with animal services to determine if that number ought to be adjusted up or down. Um, I, I would caution, though, that a lot of the language in this particular proposed amendment is the result of a lot of back and forth between my office, BCSO, and the county attorney's office. Uh, the actual ordinance itself is kind of an amalgamation of Seminole County's ordinance, which they passed in 18. Uh, there is some input, I believe, and some inspiration from Jacksonville's ordinance. And then I believe also West Melbourne's ordinance was used, which passed, I believe, in 15. Uh, to form portions of this that we then adapted to fit within county code so that it was applicable uh, while again remaining the least restrictive uh, that it possibly could be. And, and to that end as well, uh, I will eventually move for this to, um, to go to vote and to pass it. Uh, but I, I would, at the point in time when we're through public comment, when I do move to do that, I, I am going to ask for one amendment. Uh, again, in the interest of keeping this as narrowly tailored as possible so that we're not doing anything that's unnecessary to achieve the goals and also to ensure that the Sheriff's Office uh, is able to enforce this without having problems. On page four of the actual document, in the definition of hobby breeder, it, it starts out hobby breeder means any person or entity that causes or allows the breeding or studying and then it goes on. I would ask later on that we, uh, when we move to, to have this go to vote, that we strike or studying. Uh, that's something that I believe, and uh, with my conversations with Sheriff Ivey and with Mr. Hellebrand, I don't believe that's something that's going to be very logistically possible to enforce. It's something that imposes another restriction. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I, I think that we achieve the bulk of the aim that we're setting out to achieve by obliterating or striking the words or studying. So I'm not going to take up any more time. I know there are a lot of folks on both sides of the issues here. Uh, and I would, I would turn, the, uh, turn the floor over. That's a great explanation. I'm sure you'll get questions, but thank, thank you, you so much. It's a good, sure. good introduction. Sheriff Ivey, we won't take any more of your time, and we'll let you go first as a courtesy. Because you are everywhere, I have to say, in this county. Madam Chairman, Commission, thank you for allowing us to Name and address for the... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, uh, I have our uh, manager of uh, animal services, Joe Hellebrun, who, um, as everybody knows, has done an amazing job with, with his team down there. So uh, I, um, I asked Joe to, to come with me today so that he can answer any of the intricate details you guys might have. But I just want to um, start out by saying that Commissioner Lober has um, put his heart and passion into, uh, into this ordinance, um, and he understands, like I do, that um, when we look at these puppy mills, um, you know, our job is to make sure that the health and well-being of our pets and our community is, um, is righteous and is, and is doing the right thing. That's what this ordinance does. Um, there's no question that, in fact, I don't think you'll find anybody in this room that would argue that these puppy mills operate at such a level that they're putting the animals at risk, um, the animals are often sick, they're not well cared for, and that's what this ordinance is designed to do, is to um, uh, stop the puppy mills from operating. It's designed to make sure that um, we have the best um, and most healthy well-being aspect of pets in our community. The great thing about this ordinance, though, is that it encourages businesses to adopt a model that they can still um, uh, get our, our citizens any type of, of pet they would like, but um, it, uh, it also gives us the ability to make sure that those pets are healthy and those pets are well cared for. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Have... Does anybody have any questions? <clears throat> I have a quick question. Is this a big problem in the county, or is this a, a minor problem, or? Well, I, I mean, before, I, before I let Joe um, jump in, um, I think I would say this is a big problem across the country. Right. Um, when you look at these puppy mills, um, obviously we can only control and restrict what's uh, right here in our, our backyard, but when you look at um, the aspect that these puppy mills are, they're unhealthy. They're, they're, uh, they're putting the animals at risk. Um, the, the continuous breeding um, that takes place in these puppy mills puts the, the pets at risk across the board. And our, our goal is to make sure that not only the pets in Brevard County are healthy, but that this spans out and others across the, the state and others across the country follow that model. In fact, um, West Melbourne has already adopted a, a very similar ordinance here, as well as Seminole County. And uh, we, uh, we, we can only focus on what we have here, but it, it is a, a problem for us and others. You guys think that you can handle the oversight without difficulty? Yes. Um, basically, it, it's hard to measure to answer your question, the, the direct impact on this county, but we do have uh, people selling pets, cats and dogs in this community that we know are getting them from puppy mills across the country. So it is impacting Brevard County today as we stand here. Uh, what the ordinance does is it does a few very significant things. Number one, as the sheriff said, it forces the pet stores and retailers to change to an adoption-based business model, meaning they're going to have to get their animals from shelters and from animal rescue organizations that are out here saving the lives of animals every day and working hard to do that. They're not interested in making the money. So they're going to, get, they're going to be able to relieve some of that pressure from the shelters and from the animal rescue organizations. Um, secondly, uh, what it will do with the puppy mills, because it's all about supply and demand in every business that I've ever seen. So if, if we eliminate some of that demand here in Brevard County for some of these puppies that are coming from these puppy mills, hopefully it'll make an impact on them and, and either shut them down at some point in time in the future or at least reduce uh, how, much, how many animals are coming into Brevard County. The more of those animals into Brevard County reduces the health and well-being of the animals in this county because many of these animals are sick, have long-term problems that don't arise for two or three, four years down the road, and it puts a great burden on the people that adopt these animals thinking that they were purebred animals and they were going to be healthy. So um, the ordinance does a lot of very, very good things for this community and would be a, a, great, a great asset to animal services. Okay, anybody else? Oh, Commissioner Lover? First, I just want to thank Sheriff Ivey and, and Deputy Hallibrand. You all have been tremendously helpful in getting this put together. And, and quite frankly, I don't know that it would have made it to this point absent your support. Um, I, I do want to address one of the points that you brought up with respect to how big of a problem it is in Brevard. I think that's a great question. I think that Deputy Hallibrand addressed that as, as well as I certainly could, perhaps quite, quite a bit better. What I'm looking at, in addition to how much of a problem it is in Brevard, is how much of a problem it will become in Brevard if we don't do something. And the reason that I say that is, as you look at the trend and part of the, uh, the document that I passed through um, for folks to, to peruse, it includes a list of all the municipalities and all the, the local governments that have adopted comparable or in some way similar regulations. And the reason that that impacts us is as there are more counties that preclude or prescribe this type of conduct, it forces those folks to go to different areas to operate. And the concern that I have, and I, I know it's shared by many of the folks in the animal rescue groups, is that as South Florida and as other portions of Florida, West Florida, uh, even our, our adjacent neighbor, our sister county, Seminole County, uh, as they adopt ordinances like this, it tends to push um, those businesses that are making use of business models that are prescribed by this into that vacuum uh, where the handful of counties that hopefully will, will become smaller and smaller as time goes on that don't have something like this are really the only fertile ground for those businesses to operate in. So I'm, I'm concerned not just with how it's impacting us now, but the potential for it to be encouraged in the future. And, you know, quite frankly, our passing this will probably encourage them uh, where individuals that would be prescribed by this to look at other areas. So it, it really is something where every county and every municipality that moves on this is kind of forcing these folks to smaller and smaller areas. But again, my concern is, is one for my constituents uh, above and, and beyond any other individuals. It's not to say that I, I don't think it's a problem in other counties. I think it will be a problem wherever it is. Uh, but for Brevard County and for the folks that live and work here, I think it's important that we take a, a step in the right direction. Uh, obviously, with anything that involves regulation, uh, you're going to get folks on both sides of the, the fence on that issue. I can tell you as, as someone that, um, that ran on a, a staunch Republican platform, uh, I've never been 
fond of regulation. I certainly love my firearms. I would never do anything to, to compromise anyone's right to own or uh, free speech for that matter. I, I don't think that there is such a thing as, as hate speech that rises to the level that it ought to be prescribed um, by law. Uh, however, I think that there is a reason that certain regulations exist. And I, I'm not going to say that every regulation is good, but I'm also not going to say that every regulation is bad. And the sheriff knows this better than I do. Uh, Criminal laws are regulations. All a regulation is, even though it sounds like a nasty pejorative term, is it's a governmental body or a legislative body stepping in and putting in place some, some prohibition on certain conduct. And the reason that we have those laws in place and the reason that I'm looking to have this law in place is because society or the society that we now live in uh, recognizes certain behavior as morally repugnant. Now, there are, as I, as I alluded to earlier, there are other counties that may not agree, there are other municipalities that may not agree, just as brothels, I believe, are legal outside of Las Vegas, but not within Las Vegas. They're free to have the laws that they want, but in this, this community, I believe the folks that live here, by and large, support this sort of legislation. And, and to that end, and I don't know what sort of calls you've gotten, uh, Sheriff Ivey, but the most of the calls that I've gotten that were negative with respect to this ordinance, and I'm not gonna mislead anyone here to say everything's been positive and no one's had something bad to say, but the bulk of those that were negative originated from folks that were out of county and they were in one way or another either tied to the sales or the breeder industry. So it's, it's not by and large our constituents that are upset by this, it's folks that stand to lose something. I, I, Madam Chair, if I could just um, to add to that, um, uh, the calls that, that we have received um, from our partners, many of them who are, are here tonight, um, have all been very supportive of this measure. And I think to, to kind of summarize it, um, uh, this is the right thing to do. Uh, and it's such a righteous thing to do that it's happening across the country, it's happening across the state. And I think the commissioner is just exactly right. Um, we need to be ahead of that curve so that um, we don't have them flooding into our area and uh, continuing the problem. As I said, the ultimate goal is to have uh, a health and well-being of our pets. And uh, that is, uh, that's what the purpose of this ordinance is. So um, unless there's anything further, I just have one other comment, and I was, was kind of disappointed when we walked down. I thought they would play Who Let the Dogs Out or something like that <laughs> when we were coming in, but I guess not. So, we'll remember uh, that for next time. <laughs> sure. Yes, sir. Could, could I uh, just have a little bit of sure. indulgence here? Would you mind coming up? So, sure. Absolutely. Just based on your support of this, I've gotten you a, a little frame picture of, of my boy Winks. So. If, if you've never met Winks before, uh, he stands up better than I do. He's always standing on his back legs, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pleasure as always. That's cute. Thanks. Just pretend the music's playing, Wayne. <laughs> Diane Haynes. And after Diane, it'll be Bill Jacobson. Diana, I apologize. If you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Sure. Diana Haynes, 309 North Fist Boulevard in the city of Cocoa. I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Lober, for bringing this ordinance forth. Um, since 2013, I've been requesting of commissioners, along with the rescue groups, to put this in place. Um, back in 2013, I went into a local pet store in the mall to see filth and animals that were on wire cages that still stand on wire cages that everyone seems to think is acceptable. Um, in this county because nothing's been done since 2013 about that. Um, I'm hoping you'll add to this or consider the next thing, the next step to be uh, banning chain dogs because that's another issue in this county that's horrendous to see a dog chained more than eight hours a day and it goes on frequently here. Um, granted, nothing has been done for a long time and people have come before you. If you read reviews, I kind of took a little bit exception that saying that animals are not abused or in horrible conditions in this county, but if you go on Yelp and other sites and you look at particular pet stores in the county and you look at reviews that occurred as short as 11 hours ago at uh, Pets Around the World, Puppies Plus, there was some local reviews a month ago. This is public record. I mean, you can go on these sites and read it. I'm not disparaging anybody. Um, they talk about filth. They talk about conditions of the animals. This is abuse. I'm curious as to whether we had any inspections of these particular uh, stores at any point in time. 
Um, it's something that if you don't pass this, you at least enact rigorous inspections and that you ban wire cages for animals because to me, that's cruel and unusual punishment for an animal to stand hours upon hours. Matter of fact, they don't. You see them in the bowls uh, trying to get off the wire cages. So passing this law will absolutely save lives, lives of the voiceless. We're here for the voiceless. And if it affects people's pocketbooks, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, but torturing and abusing animals, that's just not acceptable on any level to anyone. And I thank you for your support on this. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Sorry, we'll get better with this clock. We're still trying to train Commissioner Lover over here. <laughs> no, it's my responsibility, so I apologize. Bill Jacobson? And after Bill, it'll be Thomas Frey? Yes, hi. Uh, Bill Jacobson, Melbourne, Florida. Thanks. This subject requires a lot more than three minutes or a minute and a half discussion. I was interviewed by the same reporter that interviewed the other day. I encourage you to look at that um, interview. I encourage you or your staff or anybody to come and visit us and talk to us. And we, I hear research and education a lot. A little bit more research, a little bit more education. The shelters aren't filling up with pet store dogs. The shelters are filling up with backyard breeder and puppy mill dogs. You know? So why not address that? Does it, it flies in the face of logic to shut down licensed, legitimate, inspected pet stores. Control them by licensing, control them by regulation. I invite anybody anytime to come and, and, and visit us and I encourage it. And there's a, you know, there's a few organizations supposedly uh, uh, that I'll mention that I think deserve uh, recognition for the cred credibility they deserve, Humane Society of the United States. I'm a small business. I can't compete against the millions that they raise. Uh, they show pitiful puppy mill uh, stories on television to raise millions of dollars. Their executives are paid well. Their pension fund is well funded. They have some $50 million plus in the Cayman Islands. Be people don't realize, though, that their real objective is veganism and that people even shouldn't have pets. They give less than 1% of the money they raise to shelters and supportive shelters. And there's another jewel, PETA, which I see pop up every once in a while. PETA, on the other hand, did come up with a shelter in California. And their kill rate was 98%. They are so rabid anti-pet ownership and vegan that they don't, people shouldn't have pets. And that was their answer. So. Uh, I just found out about this yesterday, this meeting. I've ha I have vets that are, are willing to meet uh, or to call. You can call them, get more information. But please do some more education, do some more research. Nobody's in their right mind is for, is for puppy mills. But it flies in the face of logic that if you take licensed, legitimate, regulated, inspected pet stores off the market, what's left online? These aren't Skype items, I mean, uh, you know, online items. You're not going to regulate the backyard breeders and the puppy mills. In my store, every puppy comes from a licensed, legitimate, line health history track breeder that meets a very strict protocol. And we are approved by the AKC and sanctioned by the AKC to offer what's called the AKC bundle. I can go into that, and I'm pleased coming to see us. Please get more education. Don't rush into this on this, this simpleton thing that we've got to shut down puppy mills. Of course you do. This isn't the way to do it. Um, and, and, and my regulation, we license. Take away licenses. How hard is that to license and regulate and inspect and shut down those that fail? Not hard. That's the way to go. So please don't actually end up promoting puppy mills but the ordinance says it stands in spite of <laughs> Mr. Lober. Please come and see me. Please talk to me. Please call some veterinarians that I'll give you their names and not just people that uh, get uh, duped by the Humane Society of the United States and PETA. Thomas, which, okay? Thomas Frey and Daniela Coffey will be next. Sure. Oh, you have questions? What, what if your animal has a store, what store do you have? Sir? You have a store. You it's on a shirt. Yes, sir, in the Melbourne Square Mall, the one that was... Uh, discussed, I guess, by the, the previous woman. 
I, 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 since you asked me a question, please, I'm not going to mention anybody else that's in business, but I'll, I'll give you an example. There used to be a place down the street. The bad stores eventually go out of business. What I'd like to see is a realistic ordinance to help those that are bad to go out of business sooner. There used to be a place just down the street from us. And they're out of business, long gone, so I'll mention their name, nothing but puppies. They had cute little pens, nice little padded, unsanitary but padded, hospital beds painted pink, and people would come in our store and, oh, look at those poor dogs, they're in cages. That's terrible. Well, finally, after a lot of puppies died because people carried in the parvo virus or whatever, they were finally shut down. Our puppies are away from the public for sanitary reasons, and nobody touches our puppy without sanitizing their hands. And we take extraordinary measures to, to keep our puppies healthy and safe. And I will go into detail with anybody. I challenge you to come there. I ask you, I please, to come in and see us. I can show you where we get our puppies, how we get our puppies, the strict protocol, eight weeks veterinary uh, reception exam, veterinary exam, four and a half days observation, another, although very quick exam, at that point they're looking for snot nose. Uh, come here and specially designed and equipped trucks to minimize stress. Cost $100,000 just to equip the trailer. After they get here, we have a consulting clinic, which for years has been the Village Animal Hospital on Palm Bay Road. They examine them, and even if they're pre-sold, we hold them for observation. And we hold them until they're ready. And if they're ready to go after three days observation, they go. If they're not, we hang on to them. So please give us a chance. Come and visit us. Educate yourself. Do some research. Not just the knee-jerk. You know, it sounds good to close down puppy mills. Of course, everybody wants that. This isn't the way to do it. You're going to, in fact, incite more backyard breeders, bring more back breeders, backyard breeders out of the woodwork. You're going to have more puppy mills, not less. And I challenge you to, to, to look at the population in shelters. Those, the overwhelming majority of the dogs in the shelters do not come from pet stores. They come from backyard breeders. What's your, what's your name, sir? Bill Jacobson. Thank you. Commissioner Lober has a question. It's a comment, if that's permissible. Oh. I, I just want to address a few of the items that were uh, that were brought up. As far as PETA, the Humane Society, and the SPCA, and whether one or more had uh, a Cayman Islands account, I can tell you, just to put it out there, I don't have a Cayman Islands bank account any more than I have a Switzerland's bank account, checking, savings, money market, what have you. Um, I can tell you also with those groups, None of them contacted me and encouraged me to put this together. I did this of my own volition. Now, since I put it out there and since it became newsworthy, I have been contacted by some of them. Interestingly, not by PETA. Uh, I don't agree with everything PETA does. I do agree that there are some concerns that exist with respect to PETA. Uh, the only reference that I am aware of in this entire set of documents that pertains to PETA is an explanation or a description as to what constitutes a puppy mill. And I, I would hope that if you've read that, that you wouldn't disagree that that's an adequate or a reasonable definition of a puppy mill. That's the only involvement that... that I, lo I, I, I loathe the concept of, of puppy mills. Right. Okay? So would you, but I mean, would you disagree that, that, that the only reference to PETA, which was a description of what a puppy mill looks like, that that was accurate? Or would you say what, it was What inaccurate? I'm saying as a small businessman, okay, I can't go out and... You pay for the propaganda that these so-called animal rights groups do. Respectfully, it's, they, not, it's they, not addressing they, they the influence. question, though, sir. Uh, well, what was your question? My, my question is because you had you drew issue with my having referenced PETA, and with respect to PETA, there was one and only one reference to PETA in any document. That I wasn't I referencing your thing in particular. I was referencing okay. PETA in general. Sir. Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, okay. I, I have my own concerns with respect to PETA, and I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I'm certainly an animal lover. I've never been a member of PETA. I would not become a member of PETA based on other concerns that may or may not overlap some of your concerns with them. But when you consider the, the millions and millions of dollars that organizations like the so-called Humane Society of the United States spends, okay, and, and the public perception it creates, it is so annoying that people come in and say, oh, they all come from pimping out. Oh, look at this, look at that. They don't have a clue. Like Certainly. I say, the, the two journalists that, that interviewed me in the last few days, like I said, the, the American public's attention is like one minute and 50 seconds, so our stories are always short. They talk right. to me, the one guy talked to me for probably two hours, and it was cut down to a minute and a half. Same with the interview on Spectrum today, for that right. reason. Well, I'm, so don't let them, they influence sure. people too much. I, I'm trying to be fair. If I wanted to, to kind of sneak one by, what I would have done is not, not press the button, wait until you sat down so you wouldn't have the opportunity to respond, but I'm, I'm not doing that. I, I'm one for considering all, all information that's available. Would you be willing to come and visit, or your staff? 
what, so I've talked to vets that I that I know. They what could, I will tell you is the rubber meets the road. Okay. I would if there were a benefit to doing that, but I think you've, you've misunderstood what the concern is, both that I've stated previously and that I've stated in this, this evening's meeting. I said, and I believe the, the speaker prior to you drew issue with my comment, that I, I don't have a huge concern in terms of how the pets are being dealt with once they're in Brevard County. My concern is that you have absolutely no ability to oversee or regulate those sources of pets that you use. Oh, yes, I do. In what way? I've been there and I visit. Well, first of all, they come from licensed, regulated, visited vets. And again, well, okay, when you say the, the AKC doesn't sanction us as a pet store because we're getting them from Bubba and Earl. And no offense to Bubba and Earl, but, <laughs> you know. A couple of questions with respect to that. You said that you get them from licensed, regulated, and visited vets. I was unaware that. Breeders, yeah, go ahead. Breeders. Okay. How is it that the AKC sanctions your particular store, and what, what's meant by sanction? Well, that they recognize they're trying to support the legitimate pet industry while others are trying to destroy it. And so finally, after all these years, they went around and inspected different stores, and based on their history and their track record and their knowledge and the knowledge of the breeders they're dealing with, let's support him. Let's help him out. So when people buy a duck from us, okay, we are... We offer the what's called the AKC Pet Protection Bundle, microchip, access to a 24/7 trainer, training DVD, health insurance trial, AKC health insurance. We go above and beyond the Florida Lemon Law in terms of our warranty. Um, uh, magazine. I mean, there's just, just a lot so of features I, that come with it. I don't mean to be nitpicky, but I think it's important that we have all the info. What are the specific criteria that? AKC verifies and who from AKC, if anyone, actually shows up to verify those criteria? Well, an AKC representative has an been by inspection. Plus or the county is, I'm sorry? An em employee or? Employee of the AKC, yes. And what, what specifically do they check for? They're looking for cleanliness, that we have a, a, a relationship with a, a credible veterinary clinic. We're visited every week, every week. By AKC? Without fail. No, 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 no. By a, a licensed veterinarian. And what's uh, the context of the visit? Is that something that's required by law? Or? No, no. Uh, first of all, we get puppies every week, so they examine the puppies that come in. And secondly, you know, if we have any, any suspicion of anything, you know. Well, let me, and let me, I back my dog. You know, I, I'll, give sure. you one, I'll give you one for instance. Years ago, I sold an Italian greyhound to a couple that lived on a, on a ship and they cruised around. They come back about three months later and then I sold him a d dog that was defective and blah, blah, blah. He was injured and it could have been an accident, but like a lot of people do, they didn't take responsibility. Uh, I took that dog back, gave him the money back on the condition that they would just leave, not say another word. And it cost me back then, almost 17 years ago, um, uh, $1,700 and that was with a big discount to take care of that puppy. Okay, I take care of my animals, and I have lost, a, I've spent thousands of dollars taking care of them, even when people have abused them or, or, or whatever. My, and, uh, well, if that, I couldn't give that dog away. It would have been put to sleep. Well, let me, let me ask you a different question. In terms of where you source your You're dogs. You're still with me 17 years later, by the way. Go ahead. God, God bless. <laughs> uh, where, you were speaking about where you source your dogs and that they're regulated and yeah. they're licensed. Yes, everyone. Where, where are they? Are they in, in Florida? Are they in other counties? Are they in this county? They're, no, most of them, frankly, are, are, are out of state. So, see, that's, that's the concern that Why? I have. Most breeders, most breeders, not all, not, most is not a fair statement. Many are people who think they're breeders. I, I wanted a shortcut. I wanted to know that I can't source my puppies any better or any safer. How many breeders do you believe that you buy from, roughly? You know, it, it varies. I mean, I get, I, I get a lot of paperwork with our, with our puppies I mean, two, and ten, their history. Huh? Two or ten, just to get, I mean, even a rough idea. Are we talking single digit, double digit? From an individual breeder? Right. I, mean, I get individual do dogs at an individual time. I don't buy litters. So in, in terms of, in an average year, how many sources of, of puppies or kittens do you believe you have, roughly? I can't give you a number. I mean, is it 100, 10? It's more, any, any ballpark. More, more than that. So I, see, for, example, for example, this week we got in uh, 
Let's see, uh, 14 puppies. See, that's, that goes back to the concern, and I, I don't doubt that you have every, every positive intention, but when you're talking about sourcing from an almost uncountable or a hard to quantify number of sources, it, it just causes me legitimate to question how sources, much do... not just sources, legitimate sources. There's a big difference. Well, legitimate meaning what specifically? That meaning these... that they're recognized, licensed, regulated breeders. Every single not one of them. Not people who think they're breeders or have them in, you know, in their backyard. Every, every single one of them? Every single one. And out of, out of this vast number, is it your position that you do site visits for each and every single one of that? Do I do site yes. visits? Of course not. Of course not. I don't have the money for that. Okay. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, one more. I'll give you a, one more thing. If you know things about breeds, I'll give you one example. German Shepherds, known to be 23, 24% displacic. I've sold hundreds. You know how many displacers I've had? None. That's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. It's not by accident. Okay. Labs, I've had one and I paid for it. I take care of my puppies. I back our warranty. Our warranty goes above and beyond the Florida Lemon Law, which I don't know if you're familiar I with. I am. It. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Tobaya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jacobson. I, I understand your displeasure uh, with this piece of legislation. Can you, what hasn't been discussed is how it will impact your business. Can, can you tell me how? Uh, I am not going to source puppies from unknown breeders. Okay. I had a, a young couple come in and look at it on So, So, yeah, I... I Let me finish. The, please, may I finish? I just want to know, not anecdotal, yeah. how will this impact your business? It'll put me out of business. Okay. That, that, and, and then a follow-up to the question, how, how many folks does your business employ? I'm trying to turn it over to my son. Okay. <laughs> uh, at least six. Thank you. Any other question? Like I said, Madam Chair, go ahead. I'd like to make a comment. I bought a dog from this gentleman back in uh, 1992, and I, as I recall, I got a free visit to a vet, uh, a vet which was, I think, Palm, on Palm Bay Road. The Village Animal Hospital, yes, sir. Um, and I also got a discounted uh, certificate, if it wasn't paid for in full, for having that pet spayed because it was a female which I took advantage of, uh, and, that, and I had that dog for 17 years. So I didn't have any of these issues. And that's one of the concerns that I have when I heard about this, is if we're going to put guys like this out of business that, that does and goes to great lengths to make sure that he's giving his clientele good quality puppies, I'm not sure that that's fair. I, I mean... It's kind of I don't. Dirty. I don't want to see. I don't want to see a broad brush painting everybody as bad. That because this guy provides service. I love that dog. Let and, me go and, back to that. Excuse me, sir. I'm going to go back to the example. There, I'm all for people going and adopting, but not too many people want a pit bull or a pit bull mix. Okay, what dog a breed which I have never sold, never will. Young couple, Pekingese, just married, come in, look at it. They get to the price. Oh, honey, there's too much on our plate. We can't afford that dog. I saw him about three months later, and he was asking me a question, and I answered him. And he says, I don't know if you remember me or not. And I said, yes, I do. And he said, how can you remember? I said, because I get, you're a young couple, recently married, and your wife cried when you left because she fell in love with the Pekingese. And he said, well, we got our Pekingese. We rescued him. We're out $1,200 in vet bills already, but we love him. What are we going to do? That's the scenario I want to avoid, and I've been very successful in avoiding those scenarios. Very successful. Commissioner Loba. Just, just a comment to Commissioner Smith. With respect to that, uh, again, I, I want to stress that my concern isn't with the, the particular business owner that we have in front of the podium at this point in time. My concern is that he may not be representative of everyone that we're dealing with, and the impression that I get from the Sheriff's Office is that, quite frankly, he's not. Uh, I don't think those folks who are more easily assailable in terms of their business practices are going to be inclined to show up here. And again, the concern that I have is even if this gentleman is as well-intentioned as he quite, quite honestly may well be, to have a, a number of sources to the extent that you have difficulty counting and quantifying them from which you're getting your puppies, it's impossible apart from uh, 
through anecdotal evidence. Documentation. Documentation in terms of what? what would, give me an that. example. I have the, the breeder, their numbers. You know, what, what numbers? The breeder, num the breeder numbers, the registration numbers, so depending I, on which registry. If I pay to get on a registry, what prevents me from getting a breeder number? There's, there's a process. You, could, you just don't walk in and through and say, I'm against pumping mills. I want a breeder number. It's not that simple. Well, what, what makes it more complex? I don't know. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, you're going to... I mean, that's, you, that's you, my You're just throwing, throwing, trying well, to throw I, mud and, and see if it same, sticks. I'm, I'm right. I have the same concern. I've seen puppy mill pictures and the, and the, the puppy, that, the poor female that gets bred over and over and over again until she's probably dead at age six years old. I don't know how to prevent that. But at the same time, I don't want to put guys like this out of business that go the extra mile to provide good healthy pets. Is it that hard to license? How do we get there? Is it that hard to license? It is when they're out of state. When you mentioned to me, and that's I'm a talking big concern, about here. I'm talking about you where you're getting You come into my store and I'm going to meet up to the standard, shut me down. The concern but don't is shut me down. You're, you're, you're in a position where we can regulate you. We cannot regulate the sources that you mentioned, the bulk of which are out of state. We have no ability to control that whatsoever. Even the state of Florida has limited to no ability whatsoever to control that. And that's, again, Commissioner Smith, that's the concern that I have. Not this individual and how he has uh, care and custody of the animals in Brevard. The problem is the way that the law is written now, we have no true idea in terms of even how many, how many origins there are, how many sources there are. At least when are. there's a pet store, you know where to go to. What do you mean? Well, I, I just don't understand your point that, that there are puppies that come and you can't control them. So you shut down established businesses? No, you restrict. That's going to make things can, better? You restrict where they can source their puppies. But I'm so how would you restrict, how would you restrict his, how, how would you make him better? How, that's By precluding him from obtaining puppies. And actually, the interesting thing is that he mentioned, and I, I think it, it may have been something that flew past a couple of folks that, that may not have been listening carefully. If you listen, he mentioned that oftentimes, there's many times he'll obtain one-off puppies, and he doesn't necessarily obtain an entire litter. I've never Did obtained you not a litter. Say that? I okay. buy. I buy so, to meet what I believe the people are looking for. You're not going to find a tiny Maltese, a tiny Morky, or some of the so-called mixed breeds, generally speaking, in the shelters. Shelters are generally older dogs. One heck of a lot of. Uh, you know, I can I'm, tell not, you, I'm not going to go there. I'll yeah, I, there. I don't, I don't want to have well, a debate just, where it's back and forth. Just to give you a little but. background on that dog. I had a dog that, my, that I had from college, and my wife inherited that dog <laughs> when, she, when she inherited me. And when that dog died after 16 years, she said, you can have another dog, but it's not going to be a big dog, and it's not going to be a short-haired shedding dog because I'm not cleaning up after it because she hated the shedding hair. Fair enough. So I went to animal services, and... As luck would have it, there was uh, six or seven little puppies there, and I, they didn't know what breed it, they were, but they were pretty sure that they were a smaller, smaller dog and a mixed breed that wouldn't shed. So I brought that dog, I, I picked one out, I brought it home. Unfortunately, it was a great dog. It, it only weighed about 30 pounds, so it wasn't big and it didn't shed, but it got mouth cancer, breast, um, bone cancer. So after five years, we had to put it down. So then I had to go find another dog. I went to the same process. I went to the... Animal Services, I went to Humane Society, SPCA, nobody had any puppies. So I went to his store, fell in love with a little puppy, and had her for 17 years. So if you put him out of business, what do you do about people like me? You can control me, you can regulate me and other pet stores. Shut them down, Who are you gonna, who's there to control? You think the puppies aren't gonna come in? They're gonna be ordering them online. Uh, it just yeah, and I've seen no that sense. too. I've seen people it just order makes dogs no sense. on yeah, I, order I, the, the designer dogs online, you know. Sure. License us, regulate and, and they, us, shut and us they, down. It's a nightmare. They, I see they, the advertisements for those. Yeah, you know, I don't have any issue having a debate if it's not getting circular, but I think at, at this point, at least my, my commentary with respect to this interaction is becoming circular. So, yeah, okay, but you, you mentioned, you mentioned, and in, 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 uh, you know, people should buy. I, this could go on for like ever, and we have a stack, <laughs> so I'm going to defer to Commissioner Pritchett because she's had her light on for a while. Okay, well, so I, I didn't know we'd get this far along with, with the conversation, but we've had enough points coming out. So I want to throw a couple ideas out. I threw, gave you guys a, a kind of an updated um, a version of this. 
Number one, before I even get started, I hate abuse. I do. I hate abuse with people, children, animals, and, and we have to stop the abuse. A couple things I just heard now. I, I reworked this, but I'm hearing I, probably the best way to regulate this is we're going to have to get something going at the state of Florida level as far as puppy, puppy mills. We're going to have to get something going with that. Okay, so I'm trying to decide what the problem is here. One, female dogs are getting abused with, with producing litters. Two, people are not caring for their animals and they're being taken to shelters because they're having to be adopted out. So we've got two problems there. So how do we address these, these issues? So I started doing some research on after we got this given to us. And I started trying to determine what's, what's causing the problem. So I looked up some criteria that they have on, I think you, you mentioned it, the American Kennel Association. And they only allow the dogs to give like four litters in their lifetime, and they can't have them till after the year one. And so there's a lot of criteria out there. And then I start trying to figure out, okay, what defines this as far as hobby breeders and commercial breeders? And there is a licensing in the state to be a breeder, to be a licensed commercial breeder, four litters after the year of, year of one age. So there, there is some things in place. So we have a problem with things not being... I guess uh, adhered to like the should be. So we're going to have to figure it out. We need to make sure we don't have puppy and cat mills. They they need they need to go away. We need to figure out how we're going to take care of theirs. So uh, Commissioner Lober, number one, I would like to find a way to do it at the state level so that we're we're doing a little bit more pressure on this. But I think even with this gentleman's concerned, if we put in the licensed commercial breeder in the hobby breeders, I think that would probably take care of a lot of his heartburn. Because let me tell you, I have a concern that we would lose pedigree pets. And I, I, and I think we need to take care of the shelter pets. I get it. Well, I, I disagree because I looked up the rescue people. They're starting to breed them now and sell them to the pet store. So we're starting a whole nother monopoly. So we could have a, a big situation here. So we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. We're going to have to do what's equitably fair to people and protect these animals. So Commissioner Lober, if, if you would look at that as, as we're listening to discussions, I believe if we put in licensed commercial breeders, these are breeders that are under stipulation, they get inspected through the year by the state or they lose their license. And then if we make it so pet stores have to buy from licensed commercial breeders, I think that would take care of that concern, sir, that you just had that conversation with. But again, this is, you have made me research things I never knew I'd have to research over the last couple of days. I am still nowhere near an expert, but this is what I've dug up over the last 48 to 72 hours. I even called um, the sheriff and, and asked him some questions. So as we go through this, I, I would request that maybe we table it one more time so that we can all work on it a little bit harder after, after we're all done, sir. Because I, I think a merger of minds here might, might help this out a little bit more to get to where we're trying to go to, and that's stopping animal abuse. Just a couple of thoughts, if I may. Sure. I, we probably, probably should get to public comment Yes, I point. promise I'll be as brief as possible. We, yeah, because we may learn something that we didn't know. Okay. You know with with respect to the, the first item that you brought up, Commissioner Pritchett, uh, having this regulated by the state of Florida, I'm going to ask uh, our county attorney to, to correct me if there's some misconception or misperception that I have. Based on what the gentleman had just said in public comment, the majority of the animals, as I understand it, that he sources are from out of state. And the problem is, I don't believe that the state of Florida can lawfully regulate entities that are out of state. I believe there's a huge interstate commerce issue with that. And that's something we where, that realistically, yeah. it will never happen. And if it does yeah. happen, I think it would be challenged in federal court and thrown instantaneously. That's going to be with your pet that. puppy mills. But we can do this to make sure they have to buy from licensed if, if what you're talking about is, and again, if that's something that you're inclined to do, I would encourage you if, you, if you're inclined to go that way, to be very specific in the nature and the type of inspections that you want. Uh, because if you don't have that, I see this subject to rampant abuse. I also have concerns in terms of how we would verify that. Obviously, if there's some state documentation that exists, um, it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but a licensed uh, commercial breeder, if there's a state of Florida inspection, 
we could mandate that they that they comply with the state of Florida inspection and that there not be any violations either uh, currently alleged or, or uh, that have been found with merit in X number of years or, or however long. But I just have a lot of concerns leaving it at all ambiguous or open-ended. And if it's something where we need to table it at the end of this meeting, I'm not going to oppose that. Uh, but I, I would just say obviously because we don't have the benefit of being able to communicate after this between the end of this meeting and the next, uh, the next meeting when it comes up, I would just be exceedingly specific in whatever proposal you may have because I, I am very concerned that that's going to get abused. Um, and if, if that's something where we need to fall back to that, I would rather have that than nothing. Um, I like it as it is, but I do understand your concerns, and I think that what you're suggesting, if it's got adequate specificity, ought to address those concerns. Um, but I, I don't want to take up any more time. I know there are a lot of folks who, is, as you mentioned, probably have comments that never even occurred to any of us up here. Yes, and keep in mind, too, that this is just on the agenda for legislative intent. So if, if we decide after we listen to the public and after discussion that there are certain things that everybody can agree on, um, taken out, removed, maybe even nixed altogether, then tabling to the next meeting, like advertising with those changes may work as well. But this is just legislative intent. All right, let's try this again. Thomas Frey, and after Thomas, Daniela Coffey. How are you? Uh, Tom Frey, I live in Suntry. Uh, Bill is a friend of mine. I purchased two dogs from him over the last 11, 12 years. Great dogs, beautiful dogs, uh, healthy dogs. I've also adopted a dog from the Bavard Animal Shelter from the Aloha Pet Clinic. Uh, great dog, one of the best dogs I ever had. As I was going out the door, the dog had a bump. I asked the doctor, Aloha, what's the bump? And the doctor said it was cancerous. Do you still want to adopt the dog? And I said, yeah, we'll still adopt the dog. The doctor, Aloha, was great. Took the uh, cancer out of the dog. Cancer came back. Had the dog for two and a half years. Gave the dog great life. Uh, Bill who owns Puppy Plus, is extremely reputable. Uh, he's been in business for 20 some odd years. Uh, stands behind the dogs he sells. Uh, as Mr. Smith said, you get a visit to the doctor. You get all kinds of paperwork with the dog, visit to the doctor, chips, uh, the whole nine yards. Dog, dog has been fantastic, great dog. Uh, now you want to take Bill and take his livelihood away, and you want to has a shop for twenty some odd years in the Melbourne Square Mall, which is skating on thin ice. J.C. Penney, let's see if they're around next year. Macy's is on the way out. Uh, probably thirty, forty percent of it is boarded up and uh, beautiful boards is half abandoned. And now you want to take this guy and put him out and his six employees out, and uh, I don't think it's fair, and I don't think it's. Uh, Mr. Lober's right to tell us if I could buy my dog from Puppies Plus or if I have to go to an animal shelter, which I've done both, or if I want to, you know, I don't like puppy mills. Uh, I, I don't want to buy sick dogs. I don't want to support somebody who abuses puppies, but why should, we, why should we hurt his livelihood? And I understand where the sheriff is coming from with... Uh, the people that abuse dogs and give them up, and most of them are pit bull breeds. Uh, the one that I adopted was uh, part pit bull, and uh, you know, it, it, it's tough. But he shouldn't be uh, hurt because people do the wrong thing. Uh, I, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but why should he have to suffer because there's somebody selling puppy mill dogs? You know, the guy's an honest, hardworking man sells good dogs, and that's basically all I have to say. The guy's a good guy, and, you know, we wouldn't want somebody going around kicking your business around one day or your business around. I don't think uh, California does that, don't they? Didn't they just come down, you can't sell dogs in California or something? Uh, I thought this was Florida, not California, but I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Daniela Coffey, and then it'll be Crystal Gutierrez. Hello, my name is Daniela Coffey. I'm at 13705 North Del Mabry. 
Uh, I am here to support of pet stores, their right to operate, and the consumer's right to choose. I am also here to discuss a commonly used, although inaccurate, justification for passing these overreaching ordinances. Overpopulation has been suggested as one of the, under, as one of the underlying reasons of these types of bans. Unfortunately for the opposition, the numbers do not add up. According to the ASPCA's data, along with the current demand for puppies and dogs, there is a shortage of approximately 7.3 million dogs per year. With a shortage that substantial, how can we be claiming to be in a pet overpopulation crisis? If there is an overpopulation issue occurring in this community, it is pertaining to the breeds such as pit bulls or pit bull mixes, neither of which are sold in pet stores for that specific reason. More importantly, if the entities that are possibly contributing to the overpopulation hoax are subject subjected to be banned, why are the rescues not on the chopping block as well, considering the alarming rates that they are purchasing dogs from Missouri dog auctions and importing unvetted dogs from the other cities, states, and either, even other countries? If your goal is to reduce the taxpayers' cost towards sheltering your local pets in need of homes, the importation of out-of-area dogs should be discontinued by any local shelters or rescues. In Brevard County, if Brevard County is facing a pet overpopulation problem, your culprit would be entities producing the breeds already listed, not pet stores. By the census we did on the current dogs available for adoption in your local shelters, we found the breeds most prevalent were not those sold by pet stores, but likely the products of unregulated and irresponsible breeding. Limiting your citizens to breeds like this may promote more of an issue as far as long-term uh, ownership goes. Future pet owners go to pet stores to ensure that they are getting a breed that they can handle. Limiting your community to such a small diversity may force their hand to adopt a pet not appropriate for their lifestyle, resulting in the pet re being returned, and not to the pet store where it will find the appropriate home eventually, but to the shelter where it is again at risk of euthanasia. Overpopulation is an argument developed by special interest groups who have manipulated numbers to help push their current agenda. I urge you to take a closer look as there is no proof that these types of bans benefit adoption rates in any way. General pet overpopulation does not exist, and if this community does have an issue along these lines, this ordinance is not addressing the right sources to get the result you attempt to achieve. Do not support this ordinance as written. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Crystal couple, Gutierrez? Couple questions, may I? You have questions? Yeah, okay. if I may. Yeah, first, thanks for, for coming up. I like the shirts. They are cute. Um, I have a, a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, how do you all know one another? I'm just wondering what the relationship is amongst everyone with the blue shirts. Oh, well, can she? Oh, sure. Am I, yeah. uh, like, can I stand here? Sure. That's, okay. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to break any rules. Um, okay, so we actually all either work together or are friends. Um, I personally have about, well, my entire life, I've actually been in the pet industry. Um, we got three years here, a um, uh, few pet purchasers um, or adopters, whatever. Um, and, yeah, we all are, um, we, we kind of have, uh, well, there's a campaign called My Puppy, My Choice, and basically what that is is promoting consumer um, awareness to these types of um, ordinances as well as um, giving the consumers a, a voice to be heard. Um, so, like, obviously the pet stores are represented here, and obviously the, um, uh, the rescue groups slash humane studies slash, you know, um, animal rights groups have um, been represented, but um, we also represent the consumers. And also just bring, like, information to you guys that you may not have otherwise had um, uh, brought to the table or, you know, discussed. I know you guys had contacted a few different people, but, um, you know, th this was information that I don't think would have well, been brought up otherwise. Let me ask you just to follow up, but either of you are welcome to answer it. How did you find out about tonight's meeting? Internet. <laughs> internet? Okay, well, every, yeah, you guys on are on Google. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I appreciate it. Thank you both. Yeah, yep, thank you. Crystal? How are you guys doing today? Good. Name <laughs> and address, please. Crystal Gutierrez at 13705 North Dale Mavery. So the people in the blue shirts are here today to represent the consumers of Florida. We come with petitions containing over 6,000 signatures and more that have not yet been added to this file due to short notice of this hearing. Consumers have five choices as to where to purchase a fur baby that fits their individual needs, as this is not a situation where, you know, one size fits all. <laughs> the first one being animal shelters, where dogs and or puppies can be purchased for a minimal fee. Most of these animals are surrendered by their owners or are confiscated from animal hoarders or unreputable breeders. Most of them are of like an unspecified breed that may have behavioral issues due to lack of training and 
oof, not being there long enough so that they can be, you know, assessed. The second one being animal rescues, where animals are usually received from shelter overflow problems with the same issues as the above. Third would be unregulated internet, where consumers are exposed to being scammed out of their hard-earned money on a daily basis. Many times they don't receive the specific puppy that they choose, or they actually pay for a puppy that they never receive. I did that once. I'm very naive. <laughs> Um, the fourth being private breeders, which are an excellent source of puppies. Unfortunately, there aren't enough to supply the demand for purebred puppies of specific breeds. The consumer might be required to travel a long distance and <clears throat> visit several breeders and try to find what they are looking for. Most of them don't have the time or means to exercise this option. And lastly, the neighborhood pet store, commonly owned by private law-abiding individuals who will never be millionaires due to the unexpected expenses of handling live animals. These pet stores are highly regulated by the state of Florida. The Florida pet law requires the pet store to guarantee their puppies' health and to cons comps and <coughs> compensate. What is wrong with me today? <laughs> compensate consumers for certain health issues. You can see where each source has their following for whatever reason, the final decision should be up to the consumer. I don't believe it should be up to politicians or activists. Everybody needs their own thing. Thank you. Question for her as well. Sure. If I may. Okay, I, I heard it, it just kind of clicked because I heard it once more um, in the beginning. I heard Dale Mabry, Dale Mabry, Dale Mabry. What, what is that address in Dale Mabry that everyone's <laughs> given? Because it sounded the same one. Okay, so is that, oh, it's a store? So are, are you all from Tampa then, or? Oh, yeah. We traveled a long way. <laughs> okay, well, I, I give you credit for that. Thank you. Alexandria. And then Angie Fryers. We can meet officially. <laughs> um, my name is Alexandria Julian. Um, I'm at 2124 West Brandon Boulevard. Um, okay, so actually, if you guys have any questions, you can let me know, but I'm just going to hit on a couple points here. Um, I am obviously not from this community. Um, however, the one thing that I wanted to do and be sure that got um, across today was that I do have information um, that I believe would be important for you guys to consider prior to voting on any animal retail ordinance. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, um, but in Hillsborough County in 2016, they actually proposed a pet store ban. Um, over the course of a year, we worked to obviously defend um, our business, uh, much like what these guys are doing. Um, and over the course of a year, they ended up coming up with a um, regulation-based model, which actually, can one of you guys hand them that? Thank you so much. It's in the folder. Um, so what this um, did for us was it made it to where um, we were still able to stay in business, but it regulated the sourcing of our animals. Um, we have to go inspect them annually. We actually maintain all the USDA reports, which is what I think you guys were actually asking about a second ago. Um, you had asked, um, I'm not going to single, but you had asked everybody earlier um, how you know where these dogs are coming from. There are ways to know that. Um, and I think that's where um, th this, these types of ordinance kind of like take a leap in the right direction because they go from, um, you know, where a pet store owner may not have all that information. Um, we have the USDA reports. Um, you can regulate the type of breeder that the pet store can purchase from. For instance, we don't deal with any um, breeders that have any direct or indirect violations. This is important, this is crucial, because a direct violation would harm the dog's quality of life. It would be like lack of veterinary care, something bad on the breeder's part. So if a breeder is not adhering to certain, um, you know, uh, veterinary ex uh, expectations or something that's going to harm a dog's quality of life, I cannot buy from them. Well, not me, but, you know. Our family business cannot buy from them um, in the event that they had more than four indirect. So indirect violations is basically um, what happens if someone, a puppy's like missing a collar or something like that, we would not be able to purchase from that breeder. Um, there's a, a way that you guys can regulate. I understand that these sources are out of state. That's actually a good thing. Um, other states have higher regulation than Florida does on any breeders. Um, so Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, places like that have already taken this under their wing and been like, oh, you know what? We need to regulate these breeders a little bit further than what, you know, maybe the USDA does. Um, so a lot of this um, goes back to how do we regulate them. I, we will not, we can't buy a dog from a breeder unless we've gotten all the documentations, unless we've done a visit. Um, 
XYZ. Um, the ordinance is actually in front of you. I also threw in the um, Pet Lemon Law of Florida. Um, what that is is um, basically what the retailer has to live up to um, in terms of if they sold a dog and the dog had something wrong with it. Um, all morals aside, if a puppy was sold, am I allowed to continue? It, three minutes is up. I'm sorry. I, I would love to let you continue, but if no, I would have okay. to let everybody continue for. Are there any questions? Yes. I'll be very brief. How do you know if a um, breeder has a violation on them? Um, easy. So if a um, breeder wants to work with us or we wanted to work with a breeder, we would request the um, USDA reports. So what you can get a USDA report and find out. Absolutely. The problem that okay. people have brought up is that um, the USDA reports aren't online. Um, that was for the security and the safety of the breeders because these breeders were being um, like uh, uh, harassed um, and sometimes in like um, dangerous scenarios. Anyway, um, so they pulled those USDA reports offline. So what we did was we said, you know, why, don't, why does everybody have to rely on technology? Why can't we have these USDA reports in the store? So whenever our local shelter comes and inspects us, we have all of that available to them 100% so of the time. So the breeder yes. has to bring you the reports that are... Send the reports either with the puppy or whenever we go to inspect, yes. Okay, so there is a way to, to obtain the reports Absolutely. to make sure the, re the breeder doesn't have any... Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Want these back. Commissioner Lover. Okay, with respect to um, one of the comments that you made, you mentioned that you can't buy from a breeder unless you've done a visit. Is that right? Yeah, I just, just real quickly, uh, you mentioned earlier, if I understood correctly, that you can't buy from a, a breeder unless you've done a visit. Is that right? In the year, in the calendar year, yes. Okay. So, so if I purchase a dog from a breeder this year, I have to inspect them before the end of the year. What specifically do you look for? Um, so basically what we look for is the USDA and the state requirements for that particular breeder. So as long as they're adhering to all of that, I actually included in your packet up here pictures of my personal visits with the breeders. Um, I didn't get to touch on that. I did lose well, track of time. But know, I, just, I don't want to I don't want to have you go uh, two sideways on this. I, right. I just want to make sure that we uh, that we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. So during the, the visit, you're checking for the USDA. What was the other thing? And any state regulations. So as far as like I'm not um, a uh, professional in inspecting kennels, sure. um, but that was something that the Hill Hillsborough County Board of Commissioners uh, felt was needed. That way, you know, we got our eyes on the kennel, saw the animals, saw how they were treated. Um, and in my experience, it's been nothing but incredible. To your knowledge, why is that important to actually see the kennels and the way that they're treated? Oh, that way, that way you know for yourself. I think that that's important in, in any business, obviously, but um, to know where you're sourcing your animals from. And I think that the longevity with specific breeders also speaks for that. So if I've been buying from a breeder for 10 years and I never had any problems, I can understand that that is a breeder that is following a certain moral code. It's not breeding all these bad quality dogs or overbreeding or whatever. But you would agree that there's a valid reason for you to have to inspect on an annual basis? Oh, I think, well, as required by the Hillsborough County Ordinance, yes. And as far as, I mean, I, I like my breeders, I love my breeders, so yeah, so I can visit them as much as I can. If, if for some reason that weren't a requirement, would you feel that it would be irresponsible of a pet store shop or a pet shop not to do those annual visits or not to visit breeders? I think that's up to you guys, because you guys, you, you said Just earlier. in your opinion. Oh, in my opinion? I mean, if that's something that they are able to do, yes. So you think that they ought to, to visit every, every source of dogs? Yeah, and it's, it's doable. So Thank do you. It. Yeah. I'm sorry? Madam, Madam Chair. Okay. Commissioner Tobias. Uh, can you, can I? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. No worries. Thank you for coming this long way. I really appreciate when yeah. people go to the uh, No worries. So um, you only can respond to questions. So if you had an extra minute, um, what would you say in that extra minute? Um, I actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty clever. <laughs> Chalk one up to Mr. You want to put a minute on there? <laughs> Okay, um, so basically what I wanted to go over was the things that um, I had seen and like my, oh God, I'm going to cry. Um, oh, oh Jesus, sorry. Just take your time. Whole it's minute fine. I cry, right? Yeah. That'd be great. Um, so in my personal visits with USDA licensed breeders, reputable ones, um, you can see in the photos that these dogs touch grass, they're not shoved in these stacked wire cages like they say they are. Um, they know how to sit, they know how to play, they know their names. Um, ow. <laughs> I feel every time. Um, there's a group of people that are being um, 
targeted by groups that are saying that they're um, they're lumping them in a group. And so basically, a USDA licensed breeder that is a puppy mill, and that's not accurate. So anyway, um, <laughs> wow, this is lame. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just basically wanted to um, let you guys know that there there have been eyes on these kennels, and um, regardless what anybody else here says. If someone here, like the animal control officers and stuff like that, have seen a puppy mill or something like that, that is an awful thing to witness, and I understand that. Um, but there is a way to know that a regulated and reputable breeder is, is not a puppy mill. I know that for a fact with our breeders that we work with. I know that that is possible for, um, even regardless of what any pet stores are doing now, I'm not going to speak for any other pet store because I don't know how they operate. Um, but I know that it is possible to get there, and I don't want to. Um, discourage or um, put out of business a business that is willing to be regulated because that could have been us a couple years ago so that's it I'm good <laughs> thank you so much thanks Angie Fryers and after Angie we'll have Natalie Santabria I'm Angie Fryers. Um, I live at 1217 White Oak Circle in Melbourne. I am the executive director of the SPCA in Brevard and Titusville. Um, I came to talk a little bit about the legislation you want to pass, but I'm from Ohio, and if you guys know anything about puppy mills, that's where they are. They're in Amish land, Ohio. Um, we own a home in Ohio. Within a mile radius, there's probably 20 puppy mills. I have 50 pictures on my phone right now of literally within walking distance of where I grew up and we still own the home back there. My sister and I have been kicked out of a lot of them trying to go in and get photos. One thing that um, somebody had brought up was the USA, USDA licensing inspection and regulated breeders. Sure, all of those breeders are regulated and licensed but the state of Ohio can't keep up with regulating them. They are um, too many they're underground breeders. Um, there are dogs that are dying. My father owns 18 dogs that came from Amish puppy mills that were dumped when they were no longer able to be bred. So I have a very um, close attachment to this because of where I come from. Um, one other thing that I want to say is animals that come out of an animal shelter aren't any sicker than one that you get from a breeder. Um, I have seven boxers that are purebred. They all came from a rescue. I had one that died at seven. I have one that's 13. And the 13-year-old was out of Miami-Dade, backyard breeder, had 50 million puppies. So just to kind of put into perspective, if you have the ability to go out and look at where your puppies are coming from, that's awesome. I will totally support anybody that wants to go see where their puppies are coming from. You want to go to Amish country, I will be more than happy to take you there. You can stay at our house up there. You'll be disgusted with what you see. And if a lot of these puppies that he's not looking at where they're coming from, how do you know where they're coming from? How can you say they're coming from reputable reg registration <coughs> breeders when you don't know that? It's frustrating because Florida is so far from Ohio and you're very far removed from that unless you go up there and you see literally within a mile 20 breeders. It's disgusting. Back of trailers, semi-truck trailers in the heat, in the summer, in the cold, in the winter, I know right now it's 30 some degrees up there. These puppies are out in the elements with their mothers and it's not a good thing to see. So if you would like to see pictures, I've got a whole bunch of them. Thank you. Anybody, you. anybody have any questions? Commissioner Lober? Just a, a brief comment. I want to echo something that you said. My in-laws had for 18 years a purebred Bichon that they got from Seminole County's Animal Services. Uh, so I, I would just echo what you said in my experience and my in-laws experience as well. Um, I think it's absolutely possible and it's frequent uh, to find purebred dogs in animal shelters. I think there's a lot of misinformation surrounding that. There are. We have several pure we have a poodle, we have a, um, we have chihuahuas, Jack Russells, we have, um, what's the black and white dog we have right now? The terrier. He was an uh, Australian shepherd. So we do get pures. Yeah, we have pit bulls. I don't see anything wrong with that. We get boxers. That's my breed. We get um, schnauzers. Uh, my PR girl that's here with me, she has a purebred schnauzer that came from our shelter. So there are out there. I don't know if putting, you know, legitimate uh, pet stores out of business is going to make a huge dent or, you know, 
have a million more dogs coming into me. But if you want a pure dog and you're willing to look for it, I guarantee you, you're going to find it. I got a um, seven, eight week old boxer puppy from a puppy mill in Missouri, Amish puppy mill in Missouri, that was going to be euthanized because he was deaf. And the ladies at the vet refused to euthanize him. They put him on this underground rescue and he ended up at my house. And so, you know, there's that aspect too. If the pets get, or the puppies get too old at the puppy mills and they can't be sold to puppy stores, they're euthanized. And these are healthy animals that are being euthanized. It's just, it's a very sad thing. I, I'm so shaky up here and I'm not normally like this, but just listening to some of this stuff, I was just like, you have to know what's going on in the puppy mill industry. And if you cannot go yourself to see it, how can you buy from that? How can you buy? I would never, ever buy a dog from somewhere that I didn't know where it was coming from. And let me ask you, because I, I think it's, it's important, at least, um, at least in my mind, it's important. Uh, the young lady that was up here just a minute ago, she may have stepped out for a moment. Uh, you know, she, she certainly was in agreement when I asked her, um, was there a value in having a site visit as to the places from which you source puppies? Can you just talk very briefly on that, if you, if you could take 15 or, or 20 seconds as oh, to I why that's, that's important? Awesome. Like, I love that she said that, and that's what their store does. I really think that if you went and saw these places in Ohio, you'd be nuts to get puppies from them. And, you know, kind of the whole thing where they say that they're licensed doesn't mean anything. It means nothing. Those puppy mills by my house in Ohio, they're licensed. They're disgusting. It is disgusting what these, how these animals are living. So you can be licensed, you can be inspected. There's so many, Holmes County, which is where I'm from, has the largest number of puppy mills in that county, licensed puppy mills in that county. There's 50 million of them that don't get inspected. But why is the state of Ohio not doing anything it's, about it? They're trying, it's such a hard thing to regulate. And there's a lot that fly under the radar. You know, the one that I have pictures of that have the puppies in the, the truck trailer, they have all the records. Nobody's been out there to see them. Nobody. And then there's it a... It sounds like a failure of the oh, state. Oh, it's terrible. You know what I mean? It, it is horrible. It is absolutely horrible. And that's a huge failure on the state of Ohio. It's terrible. They're making changes. There are new regulations that were just passed um, in 2018 towards the end of what they need to do to be a puppy mill. I don't know, they don't really call themselves puppy mills. They get upset if you call them that. But breeders, legit breeders. I mean, really, if you put a floor like this in instead of a wire one, does that really make you better? The, the, the mothers and the fathers are the ones that are suffering. They might make it here and be completely healthy puppies, but what about the ones that don't? What about the parents that are suffering? I mean, that's kind of the whole point of this, is to get rid of the puppy mills. The ones that are still suffering. My dog that came to me, which is, he's deaf, he, was, he would have been a statistic of a puppy mill because he was out of the age to send to a puppy store and he was deaf, so they wouldn't have taken him. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Natalia? And after Natalia, Teresa? Clifton? Hi, my name is Natalia St. Abrea. I'm up here for the My Puppy, My Choice. Um, I've gotten two puppies from the All About Puppies. Um, I'm just, I come around for the, long, for the ride because it's, it's something I'm passionate about. I've gotten a puppy from the shelter. I used to have a pit bull terrier mix. Um, she's an amazing dog and absolutely loved her. I've had a dachshund before that we got from a family friend. My great Dane Rottweiler is from Craigslist. And then I have a walrus, which is a sharp pay basset hound mix that I got from the store. Um, all of them are amazing dogs, healthy. I love them. Uh, the biggest reason why I come today is because I like to talk about their store. Um, and that not all pet stores are bad. Basically, when I went in, it's, they do have two years of the USDA reports. Um, the biggest thing is when they get their puppies and they're upfront about it, they have two years there in the store. They need it th the most recent two years. It's not like, oh, two years and you have some that are from five years back. It is the most recent two years. Um, so breeders have the capability to get their licenses every year and make sure that they're being checked out and they're passing their inspections. Um, as well as when I went there, I pet lemon law and everybody was absolutely sweet, um, free vet exam and like I said my two dogs are healthy and I absolutely adore them, um, the dachshund I got my mom for Mother's Day. 
Um, so I don't think that the pet store ban will do any good because, I mean, I got my babies from the pet store and they've been amazing and without them I wouldn't have my babies. Um, and they're literally my children with stockings for Christmas and Easter baskets, everything. So I wouldn't want to see that happen here. Um, I've seen in other counties where it does happen. Um, you hear about people that they do go sourcing online and they don't get the puppy that they pay for or that does promote backyard breeding. As much as we don't want to see that or think about that, it doesn't take away puppy mills or turn away the backyard breeders. Instead, it kind of just promotes it because that's when everybody's really going underground for everything. So wouldn't, I would think it'd be better to regulate. I mean, the pet stores are amazing and just put regulation on them is what my belief is. I don't believe in this pet store ban at all. Um, and that is it. Thank you. Oh, Commissioner Lober. Just real briefly, in terms of putting regulation on the pet stores, what can we do here? Because I, I try not to be inflexible when it comes yeah. to something like this. My goal is my goal, and I'd like to accomplish that through the least restrictive means. Mm -hmm. What specific regulation or regulations do you believe that we have the power to put in place that would address the concern with respect to where these dogs and cats are sourced? Well, for example, um, I know they keep bringing it up Hillsborough County. Um, and you don't even have to completely follow them. They're just kind of like a model. I mean, we do encourage you go your own way, make your own ordinance that works for you guys and what you feel is best. Um, simply for them, it's the two years of the USDA report, the inspections. Annual and then, inspections. Um, yes, even including the stores get them. The stores, okay. every year, sheriffs, um, animal services come by and inspect the stores to make sure that there are packets that the stores have for the puppies. Um, we're there looking to make sure that that packet is, matches the puppy, microchip, breeder information, like my dogs. Um, I have the breeder's name. I have her USDA number. I have where she's from. She even included like parent pictures of um, his parents and then even her phone number. So I've been able to contact her and ask about even more dachshunds being sent to the stores where I can get another one because I'm obsessed with dachshunds. Um, but, you know, not all breeders are bad. Um, but like I said, it's kind of up to you guys and which path you guys want to go. Um, the USDA reports, it's, they have the USDA report, it's how you guys want to follow it, as in, for your county, do you believe that the U USDA reports cannot have more than two indirect um, violations or no indirect violations? That's up to you um, to kind of further everything. So you not only can you require a USDA report, but you can require that they can't have s certain things on them. So that would kind of be another way in helping you guys make sure that the puppies are coming from amazing places. And let me let me ask you too, and I, I apologize for keeping you up oh, here. No, I just okay. I'm trying to make as much use of, of the information that you have since you've made it all the way out here from Tampa. Of course. Um, in in terms of what the practical impact of that is on the pet stores out there, have you found that the vast majority of puppies and kittens that are sourced are sourced somewhat locally on account of their having to provide these, these um, or conduct these site visits? Or is it something where uh, the stores are still willing to, to go to farther geographic lengths to still get the puppies and the kittens? They're still willing to go further out. Um, for example, Florida doesn't really have many breeders to begin with. Um, at that, they don't really have USDA licensed breeders. There's not many that you can find in Florida. Um, so even though they are farther away, it's, they are USDA licensed. And as she said before, certain states require, have more on top of that as well that is required from that breeder. Um, Florida doesn't really have much, which we probably should move to have, Flor to have Florida kind of, you know, make more restrictions. But the start is, you know, going to states that do have those restrictions. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa? Thanks. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Commissioner Lober, for bringing this up. Um, I, I have a video that I think sums up what the real issue is. And it, it has nothing to do, as far as I'm concerned, anyway, I'm sorry, I'm Teresa Clifton, I'm the Executive Director of the Central Brevard Humane Society, 1020 Cox Road in Cocoa. <laughs> and we do get puppies and kittens or animals that people have purchased at pet stores that didn't work out because they have behavioral issues. Not all the time. And it probably has nothing to do with any businesses here. It happens. It happens whether you're getting them from one place or another. But the issue really, the, the deeper issue, 
is to cut off. It's called supply and demand. So for me, it's what they're talking about, being able to regulate it. And this, this shows where if you don't, this is where it comes from. This just happens to be from, this was put together by the Humane Society of the United States, of which we're not an affiliate, but it is showing this, this is what the problem is. This is the problem. Can you hear us? You're talking about food that is contaminated, water filled with algae sometimes, dogs that are emaciated. It's a horrible, horrible existence for man's best friend. This is the life of a puppy mill dog. Melanie Kahn with the Humane Society of the United States says many puppy mills have hundreds, some even thousands of dogs. They never get to have human interaction like most of the dogs that we own ourselves. It's a horribly sad experience for these dogs. Which leads to dogs with severe physical and emotional problems. Dogs scared of anything, including grass, because they've never seen it before. We see horrible physical conditions, problems with the paw pads from being on those wire floors for their whole lives, eye problems, ear problems, it just goes on and on. With an estimated 10,000 puppy mills in the United States, the industry rakes in hundreds of millions of dollars a year. It's a profit-driven industry, so there's very little incentive for these puppy mill operators to stop producing dogs at this alarming rate. Even more alarming, the number of people who own puppy mill dogs but don't even realize it. Many consumers unknowingly purchase puppy mill dogs at pet stores and online without knowing where the dogs came from. When you do make the decision to purchase a dog in a pet store, what you're doing is supplying the puppy mill industry. You are condemning that puppy's mother and father breeding in a puppy mill to those horrible conditions for their entire lives. But you can Oops. help put a stop to puppy mills. Sorry, <laughs> I thought that would make it go away. No civilized society should ever allow dogs to raise in these kinds of conditions. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Technical issue. That is what the problem is. If we knew where they were coming from, it wouldn't be a problem. But when, admittedly, one of our speakers said he he couldn't afford to go there, so. I, I mean, I would be happy to go and check. I just know that after 15 years of running the Humane Society, it is really sad to see that animals continue to be treated like a commodity. They are a life, and they deserve a good life. And we can talk about all their different animals we've adopted from different places, all we like, but the fact is, if you are selling puppies or kittens and you don't know, you have not stepped foot into where they hey, were Ms. bred Clifton, from, and I, I and that's hate it. to cut you off, but I, I understand. Be fair. I'm, I'm sorry. Done. I'm done. Does anybody have so. questions? Nope. nope. Okay. Harriet Prine? Prinnell? Prinnell? Prine, I'm sorry. You have an extra like line there. That's why I said, oh, see it. I'm not crazy. And then, there. and Cindy Morales after. My name is Harriet Prine, and I live at 1593 Stafford Avenue on Merritt Island. Uh, I have a tendency to get on a soapbox because I'm very passionate about the uh, welfare of all animals. And um, I support, I do support the responsible breeding of animals, okay? So I don't want anybody to think that, you know, because we are a rescue group and because we are against puppy mills, that we are against all breeders. Responsible breeders, that's fine. But to keep me on track here tonight, I'm going to read what I have, you know, said and what I want to say. Um, Coastal Poodle Rescue has been in existence now for 15 years. We are a nonprofit, all volunteer, 501c3 organization. Uh, I'm here to support the ordinance that uh, Brian Lober has uh, brought forth. Um, all of you 
without seeing the pictures that uh, Teresa showed, are, I'm sure, aware of the horrible conditions the dogs and cats in these mill situations live. Uh, it is also common knowledge that the main outlet to sell offspring of the dogs and cats living in these terrible conditions is through pet stores throughout the nation specializing in the sale of dogs and cats. We, as an organization, have just one question. Another question, or oh, this is a question. Uh, what happens to all the dogs and cats that go to these pet stores and they're never bought, they're never purchased? What, 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 do, the, what do the pet store owners do with these dogs? Um, I, I don't know, and I, I would really like to know. Um, we've been involved, Coastal Poodle Rescue has been involved with the intake of many dogs from puppy mills and backyard breeders. I've seen the situation that is, has been shown on the video. Um, it's, it's deplorable, and uh, the conditions are terrible. The dogs that, that we get from there are always ill. They have no vaccines. They need dentals, and they're never socialized. Some of them have genetic uh, defects, which are carried over into the puppies. I mean, that's reasonable, right? So uh, my heart goes out to the adult dogs that are in these puppy mills. They are kept in the puppy mills and, back, and, and with backyard breeders. I am so against backyard breeding because we have gotten many dogs from those, too, that are in deplorable condition when, we, when they're turned over to us. Um, that, uh, okay, I lost my place. Okay, breeders. Oh, okay, they're bred, these dogs are bred over and over again until they're no longer of use to the owners. They're a crash crop. Uh, they, you know, to produce a couple of uh, litters a year, and uh, they're just, and then they're shipped out to pet stores throughout the country. Uh, many of these dogs. Hey, hurry up. Oh, sorry. I hate to cut you off, but we gotta. Okay. I would love to let you speak but again. <laughs> okay. You've already seen. I have ten cards here still, and you've already okay. seen. All right. Thank you very much. You have and questions? I hope that we will pass yes, some. We're probably going to have to take a break soon because if this is any indication on how the rest of this is going to go, I think. Mm -hmm. Just real briefly, is there any critical point, point that you needed? Is, thank you. Is there any critical point that you needed to make? If, if well, there were one item that you had to add that, um, well, in my opinion, okay, let me, let me just state my opinion on this ordinance. If we can limit the sources, pet stores, that is apparently what you're looking at now, uh, where puppy mills can sell their stock in large numbers, we can make a dent in the number of puppy mills that exist. I pray that you will consider this ordinance and I hope that by doing so, it will enlighten our public about this, ob this obvious need. And that um, it will also enlighten the public in regard to the dogs that are in rescue, that need proper homes. Um, and I thank you. Thank you, ma'am. For letting me speak. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And if the commission will indulge me, I just would like to give everybody a 10 minute break to stretch and give staff a, a break to use the facilities or whatever they need to do, but I, I just know that this is going to go on a lot longer, and I hate to make everybody wait another hour for a break, so we'll adjourn for 10 minutes. Thanks.